This is KVR, Kaiju Vision Radio, Episode 54, The Submersion of Japan. Hello, Kaiju and Tokusatsu fans, and welcome to Kaiju Vision Radio, a podcast about the appreciation of Kaiju and Tokusatsu movies and discovering their historical and cultural value. I'm Brian Scherschel. And I'm John LeMay. Yes, that's right, everyone. We've got John back for another episode. This is going to be great. We're so glad to have you on the show again. Like I said in my social media posts for the show, I was writing the episode for The Submersion of Japan before, during, and after Typhoon Hagabus passed through Japan. There's a typhoon at the very end of the story in Komatsu's book that finishes off what's left of Japan and all the islands sink. Hagabus caused rivers to flood and it spawned a tornado too. And then during the typhoon, in Chiba, which is the east side of Tokyo Bay, there was a 5.7 magnitude earthquake. Hagabus is the worst typhoon to hit Japan in decades. So while writing content for this episode for the show, Japan experienced a typhoon, floods, a tornado, and an earthquake. Kaiju Vision wishes the best to the people of Japan. We wish you a quick recovery. My heart goes out to the over 70 dead and over 200 injured. I wish the country of Japan a speedy recovery. I have a link to a charity called the Super Typhoon Hagibis Relief. It is from an organization called Peace Wins Japan. The site is globalgiving.org, and the link is on kaijuvision.com and in the show notes in your podcasting software and on YouTube. In this episode, we will be covering the 1973 film The Submersion of Japan, or the literal Japanese title is Japan Sinks. After part one, I'll be talking with John about this incredible blockbuster tokusatsu masterpiece, its origins and background. And then, I'll continue with the rest of the episode as usual. When I was researching for this movie, I thought to myself, is this actually what's going to happen to Japan if we fast forward millions of years? From what I can tell, no. Eventually, Japan will reverse course and start moving west again. And I'm talking tens and hundreds of millions of years into the future. Japan will end up crashing back into Asia, and North America will crash back into Africa, and there will be a new supercontinent. But no, Japan is not going to disappear, it's not going to sink unless something else happens that no one else knows about right now. That's the fiction part of this science fiction. But the movie is built on a very solid scientific foundation. So it's a sci-fi movie. It's a disaster movie, too. Is it a horror movie? I would think if you're in Japan and lived through a major earthquake, or if you lived through a fire tornado, you'd be horrified by this movie. It would cause you to recall the pain of past dramatic experiences, much like the first Godzilla movie would do with survivors of the atomic bombings or survivors of the fire bombings in Tokyo during the Great Pacific War. This movie recalls the Kanto earthquake as well as the Great Pacific War. The more I watch this movie, though, the more it seems to become a horror film to me, and I can see some Japanese people reacting strongly to these images. When there were disasters all over the country of almost every kind, Disaster footage in a movie can and will affect you differently. The related topic for this episode is the 1923 Great Kanto Earthquake. As always, check the show notes for the times to skip to if you want to go to Part 2 or Part 3 now. There is also a divided up version of this episode as well. Much like the episode on the anime trilogy, this episode will be divided into three parts. Kaiju Vision is on YouTube as well, Subscribe and see all of the episodes with original videos. A short description of the film is next. It is Kaiju Vision's unique, audience-focused method to arm the listeners with the facts. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. The sinking of Japan is occurring because of an extremely fast, large, and cascading diastrophism. The west coast of Japan facing the Sea of Japan is being pushed up, and the east coast of Japan facing the Pacific Ocean is sinking. As Japan sinks from the east to the west, the country experiences nearly every kind of natural disaster on an unprecedented scale, 
volcanoes, lahars, landslides, earthquakes, tsunami, and wildfires. Dr. Tato Koro is an extremely serious, intelligent, and driven scientist. With regards to predicting the future, he trusts his gut feeling. His goal is to save as many Japanese people as possible from the unfolding disaster. Toshio Onodera is an experienced submarine pilot. He's primarily focused on his job. He becomes much more sacrificial as the story progresses, rising to the occasion to help his people when they need it the most. Reiko Abe is a rich, beautiful, and direct woman who wants to marry Onodera and have children. Prime Minister Yamamoto expected to have an uneventful term as Prime Minister, but he must also rise to the occasion and provide leadership in a difficult time. He is hardworking and thoughtful. Watari is a wise and rich 100-year-old power broker in Japanese politics. He takes a lead role in starting up and funding the D-Plan, the roadmap for how Japan can manage this crisis. Hanai is Watari's quiet and faithful niece who takes care of him. The human and disaster plots are unified, as the characters are constantly affected by the disaster. Japan's sinking is the problem. After the problem is first noticed in the deep trenches of the Northwest Pacific, the D-1 plan is initiated to find out what's going on. When it's clear that Japan will indeed sink into the ocean, the D-2 plan for evacuation is initiated. The options presented are to evacuate and stay together to build a new Japan somewhere, to evacuate and disperse all around the world, or to remain in Japan. The Japanese and assisting countries use boats, ships, airplanes, and helicopters to evacuate, but only a few million Japanese are able to escape. The problem is not solved, and the D-Plan is decommissioned when the evacuation process ends. Dr. Tadokoro and Watari stay at Watari's private residence to die with Japan. Onodera and Reiko end up on seemingly opposite ends of the earth. The Prime Minister takes Hanai with him to safety. The ending of the film shows Japanese refugees on trains in desolate locations. The screenplay by Shinobu Hashimoto is complex with some subplot activity, mainly the subplot involving Onodera and Reiko. It is based on Sakyo Komatsu's best-selling novel Nippon Chimbotsu, or Japan Sinks. Komatsu was known as the Arthur C. Clarke of Japan. His novel was released in March 1973 in two volumes and sold 3 million copies, making 120 million yen, or 1.5 million present-day dollars. Komatsu started writing the book in 1964, wishing to reconsider what is Japan within a post-war context. Komatsu sold the rights for the film version to Toho for 1.5 million yen, or 18,900 present-day dollars. This was followed by the release of the English translation of the book, Japan Sinks. There are parts of the original book not included in the English translation. Though not everything from the original book is used in the movie, the movie is remarkably faithful to the book. The film had a budget of 2 billion yen, or 25.1 million present-day dollars. The production value is well above average due to its large budget and high-priority status at the studio. Toho Pictures and Toho Izo co-produced the film. Shiro Moritani directed the film. The special effects, directed by Teruyoshi Nakano, are impressive, featuring models, miniatures, back projections, superimposition, composites, and extensive use of fire and water in disaster scenes. Some stock footage of real disasters, such as volcanoes, was interspersed with the special effects. There was clearly a lot of care put into creating the effects. Masaru Sato's score is intense while not overpowering. Some of the best moments in the soundtrack are when softer music creates suspense and heightens the intensity. It was filmed in Panavision with monaural sound. Like Dr. Tadakoro, the tone of the film is dark, with a heavy atmospheric level of gravity and utmost seriousness. There are some horrific moments showing victims of disaster trying to escape with their lives. However, the film has plenty of nuance to avoid becoming a parody of itself. It is a sci-fi film as much or even more than it is a disaster film, which is the result of the film being so grounded in real scientific principles. Like the original Godzilla film from 1954, it portrays extraordinary events in a realistic setting. As far as if this movie is experimental, it's mostly not, because there weren't that many risks other than the large budget. The book was already a huge success, so the studio had to have known this movie would be successful. However, it did do something new, 
which was proved to the studio that big-budget disaster movies could give them a handsome return on their investment. The same formula had already been applied in the United States with films like Airport from 1970 and The Poseidon Adventure from 1972. The submersion of Japan reinforces the style of previous disaster movies from the 1960s from Japan, such as Gorath and The Last War, except instead of a rogue star or a nuclear war, it's an unprecedented diastrophism. The submersion of Japan is ultimately an expansion of style because this elevated the importance of disaster movies in Japan and disaster and sci-fi movies as a genre. The 2006 Japanese film Japan Sinks, which has the English title Doomsday, The Sinking of Japan, is a remake of The Submersion of Japan. The movie called Everything Other Than Japan Sinks is a 2006 dark comedy parody of the 2006 remake. The movie was made for fans of Komatsu's book, fans of science fiction movies, disaster movies, special effects films, and some fans of kaiju. The movie is an absolute spectacle, and it attracted a wide variety of the Japanese population. The submersion of Japan is, in a way, a horror film on a national scale. The story has a lot to say about the Japanese nation as a whole, which undoubtedly made people want to see it. The film was released on December 29, 1973 in Japan, and was a smash hit. It was the highest grossing Toho film of the 1970s. It made 5,340,000,000 yen, or 67.2 million present day dollars. The film was released in the U.S. as Tidal Wave in May of 1975 through Roger Corman's New World Pictures. That movie database has a combined entry for both the submersion of Japan and Tidal Wave, which needs to be fixed. It has a rating of 5.4 with a total of 298 votes at the time of the release of this episode. The submersion of Japan is relatively well known and loved by the tokusatsu fanbase. The original 143-minute film was cut down to 82 minutes for the American version. The film was dubbed and received the King of the Monsters 1956-style treatment with cinematography by Eric Saarinen and starring Lauren Green as the U.S. ambassador to Japan, among other American actors. The American version was directed by Andrew Meyer. A huge portion of the original film was cut, and like other films that received this treatment, the movie lost most of its meaning and what made it special. It became much more of a run-of-the-mill disaster movie. It did well in the American box office, making $3.5 million, or $9.2 million present-day dollars. Some Americans thought Tidal Wave was a rip-off of the 1974 American film Earthquake because it came out before Tidal Wave. However, since the submersion of Japan was released in 1973, there is no way that the original film could be a rip-off of Earthquake. There are a number of forces at play. There is a conflict set up between Japan and nature itself. The movie emphasizes the challenges the Japanese people face as a nation by showcasing their vulnerability to natural phenomena. The Japanese people are separated from their homeland, creating all kinds of feelings among the audience, particularly feelings about what they would do in the face of such a disaster. There are a couple of themes to this story. Komatsu wrote the story because he wanted to reconsider what Japan means and what being Japanese means in a post-war context. He saw that Japan recovered from the loss of the Great Pacific War very quickly, and that the pre-Kanto earthquake prosperity, consumerism, and exuberance had returned. Like some Godzilla movies, the submersion of Japan depicts all of Japan's post-war prosperity being destroyed, and the human characters are stretched to the limit of their ability to cope. Coping with disastrous events is part of the Japanese experience, and this story is about the ultimate disaster occurring in Japan. This film is incredible because it is so much more than just a disaster movie. It connects with the zeitgeist of the Japanese national spirit, which is what makes it unforgettable. That concludes part one. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. I'll start in with my reflections. There's so much to say. Regarding the possibility of Kurosawa directing this, it obviously would have blown me away but I think this is still good. Obviously, I don't have to have Kurosawa direct a movie for me to love it. I still think it would have been epic, and probably epically expensive for Kurosawa to direct a Godzilla movie, let alone this. This movie was already expensive, and Kurosawa would have made it even more expensive. The music by Masaru Sato is incredible. He's my favorite Japanese composer from this whole era. I loved his music from all the movies he's done, 
movies like Godzilla Raids Again or Ebra Horror of the Deep, Crazed Fruit, Throne of Blood, The H-Man, The Hidden Fortress, The Bad Sleep Well, Yojimbo, Sanjuro, High and Low, Red Beard, Son of Godzilla, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla from 1974. He's an absolutely world-renowned genius composer. About the editing of this movie, it is incredible. Michiko Ikeda edited this. The first film he did that I've seen was actually Godzilla vs. Megalon, which he did right before this movie. He went on to editing Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, then he did Godzilla vs. Biollante and Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, two of the stronger movies in the Heisei series. I want to address disaster movies in general for a little bit, to give some context. Airport from 1970 was a huge deal, and I saw it in the 1990s when I was younger. I didn't know it made so much money, and that it had that many Academy Award nominations. It is a good movie, though. I saw the sequels to Airport 75, Airport 77, and The Concorde, Airport 79. I had seen Airplane from 1980 before I saw any of these movies, and seeing the serious movies made me appreciate the parody much more. The sequels to Airplane and Airport aren't very good either way. They have that in common. I saw Earthquake from 1974, The Poseidon Adventure from 1972, and a few other disaster movies from the 1970s, which was the golden era of disaster movies. Earthquake has Lorne Green in it, and he was in Tidal Wave, too. It seems like disaster movies from the 1970s had to have George Kennedy in them. These airplane-related movies don't apply to the submersion of Japan very much, but movies like Earthquake, Virus, and Meteor do. I did see Virus, which was from 1980, and is also known as Day of Resurrection. It's very late in the disaster movie fad of the 1970s, but it's a very good movie. It's also based on a story written by Komatsu, who wrote The Submersion of Japan. It's much more thoughtful, just like The Submersion of Japan is, and it's funny George Kennedy is also in that. Meteor was a Hong Kong, United States production released by AIP. I had to wait nearly an hour watching this for anything to actually happen, so anyone who thinks The Submersion of Japan is slow is crazy. The Submersion of Japan is a slow build-up, but you're stuck to your seat because you want to see what's going to happen in the end. Meteor was more just a bunch of dead space until the actual meteor disaster starts happening. The American movies from the 1970s had ensemble all-star casts, high budgets, and impressive special effects. They also had plenty of human drama going on in them, at least the best ones did. The Poseidon Adventure sure did, and so did Earthquake. The Towering Inferno involves a super-tall skyscraper, 135 stories tall, that a fire breaks out in. And that's impressive, too. The thing is, these kinds of movies often require big budgets, and if the movie didn't make enough money, then the movie itself is a disaster. By the time the late 70s came around, that's what happened. The novelty wore off, and then Hollywood dropped them. The second half of the 1970s saw some pretty bad movies. Really formulaic, shamelessly killing lots of people, forced over-the-top acting, and the situations kept getting more ridiculous. The Swarm is one of the most ridiculous ones. It's a swarm of killer bees that causes one disaster after another. So over-the-top. It would have been interesting to live during the 1970s just to see all these movies get worse and worse and more over-the-top. Critics largely hated them as they went on because they just became totally empty movies. Critics booed and hissed at the Cassandra Crossing premiere, even though it made $15 million in Japan. Apparently they liked it. These movies ended up becoming parodies of themselves, and then the audiences just stopped caring. 1979 saw a bunch of bad ones, and thankfully the fad ran out of gas. My point here is that the submersion of Japan was made at the peak of the disaster film genre, 1973, because the early 70s was when these were the best. All these movies, though, about disasters that were made in America, they lacked what Submersion of Japan has, which is an event on a large enough scale, plus there's a deep connection to the national psyche. One thing the Submersion of Japan doesn't have is a lot of human drama. But that's not the point. The scale is so big that the human drama is hard to emphasize. It's more about the national experience and the country going through all of this together. 
It's about the collective experience, which makes sense. It's Japan. This movie is a lot like the 1954 Godzilla movie, and that the whole country is going through this traumatic experience together. Komatsu also meant for it to be this big, as he wanted it to be a reflection on post-war Japan and on the meaning of Japan. There is suspense in everything in these other American movies, but the submersion of Japan destroys an entire nation-state. It's hard to top that, other than these worldwide apocalypse movies, which there are like a, almost a subcategory of their own. There were disaster movies that destroyed the whole world, but the movie isn't released worldwide and it isn't too, on too big of a scale. But The Submersion of Japan has a lot of soul, albeit large-scale soul, because it deals with such an important question. What will happen to the Japanese people? This movie is original enough, too, and you don't feel like it's such a formulaic experience. Disaster movies are technically a subgenre of action movies, but is The Submersion of Japan an action movie? I don't know if I'd describe it that way. I, don't, I wouldn't describe it as a drama, either. It's bigger than that. Sure, there is action in it, but the special effects and the scope of the story are about so much more than that. And it means a lot more to me than many other disaster movies that I've ever seen. It's not just a disaster or an accident, it's a catastrophe, it's a crisis of existence. So that's why I address these other movies of this time period, is to draw distinctions and to say how special this film is, and how much it means to the Japanese, and how much it means to me. Now that I've done my general reflections on the genre some, and on the movie, I'm going to talk with John some more about what makes this movie so interesting. And with me now is John LeMay, the author of many books, but mainly Terror of the Lost Tokusatsu Films, which, also, which uh, discusses the submersion of Japan, as well as uh, another book that I got about unmade Godzilla films. And the one that he has out now, as of March, was a book about the unmade Kong movies called Kong Unmade. So welcome, John. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. I think last time I was on, we talked about Varan the Unbelievable. Was is that right? Yes, that was a great show. That was a good, good movie too, and it's more obscure. And that's a great, great one to have your help with because uh, it's a, there are a lot of facts about it that are just kind of out there and nebulous. And this one is so well known in Japan, and I've seen this thing like a hundred times now, but. I had to read your book, Terror of the Lost Tokusatsu Films, in order to learn something about the background of Submersion of Japan, which there's a, this is a big movie, it made Toho history, it was a giant, big money, money earning blockbuster, big huge movie, so I figured you would be good to have, to give some background, and sort of flesh out more about the story of this movie, which is, uh, it's amazing, I, I, this is such a big undertaking by Toho, and it's one of the reasons why I decided to do season two in the first place, just focusing on all of these Toho non-Godzilla films, and then not even the, some of the non-Kaiju special effects films like this, and also this month will be Prophecies of Nostradamus, which I just absolutely love that too. So I just wanted to first go over some of the background with Submersion of Japan. So uh, Sakio Komatsu, the author of Submersion of Japan, has a, a really interesting history with Toho. Um, basically, Toho had bought the rights to two of his books in the past, and they didn't actually make them. I believe in 1964, they bought the rights to Komatsu's uh, sci-fi novel called Japanese Apache, which was like a post-apocalyptic Mad Max type storyline. And Toho thought about filming it, and they didn't. The next one was Toho actually bought the rights to adapt uh, his manga, East Bay, um, in 1967. That one didn't get made either. And ironically enough, um, Submersion of Japan was their third attempt to make one of his films, and it was the one that they finally actually made. And what's even more ironic is when Submersion of Japan became a huge hit, that's why they made East Bay in 1974, it was just because... It was, you know, a Komatsu property they had the rights to, but I guess I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, but again, to backtrack, he started Submersion of Japan in 1964, and I have a really great quote from Komatsu that he told Brett Homnick in a 2000 issue of G-Fan. Komatsu says, I started to write uh, Japan Sinks in 1964, and it took nine years to complete. 
until the 15th of August, 1945, when the Showa Emperor officially declared the end of the war to the Japanese nation. All of the Japanese, especially a teenager like me, believed in governmental slogans such as honorable death for all hundred million Japanese nations or decisive battle is when Americans landed on mainland Japan. We all made up our mind for the coming death. However, once the war was over, Japanese overcame the consequence of defeat so easily, and by the 1960s, people were happy about the rapid economical growth of the country. When I saw those circumstances, I wanted to reconsider the meaning of what Japan is and what Japanese are. That is why I wrote Japan Sinks. Yeah, so this is a lot about the Japanese identity, what it means to be Japanese, and what the nation of Japan means. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in part two here about is about the, the, how meaningful this is because it's, it's a big deal. This is not just a disaster movie. It is a disaster movie plus so many other things. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk about this later, but you know, tidal wave, the U S version of Japan sinks cuts out, um, over an hour's worth of footage dealing with the more Japanese aspects of the film. But again, we'll cover that later. Um, an interesting fact that a lot of people may not know is that uh, Dai before Toho were the ones who wanted to adapt this novel into a film. Um, it was kind of hackneyed how they went about it. I believe it was 1971 before they went bankrupt. Uh, they wanted to do kind of a disaster movie about the Kanto earthquake. But then they heard that Komatsu was working on this novel about all of Japan sinking. And they thought, well, we want to do a movie on this. And before they even secured the rights from Komatsu, they had announced it for production in 1971, along with Gamera vs. Two-Headed Monster W. And both of those films, you know, never came to be because Dai went bankrupt shortly thereafter. Now, when Submersion of Japan was actually published on March 20th, 1973 by Kobuncha, uh, it became a smash best bestseller. It sold over 3 million copies and made uh, 120 million yen. Um, I have two different stories about Tomoyuki Tanaka in this book. One is that Tanaka optioned it for film before it actually came out. But a different account I read said that he bought it the day of its release, read it in one day, and he excitedly called Komatsu that evening to ask ask him about the film rights. And Komatsu has a really interesting quote on that. I'm going to read it. So Komatsu, uh, he reminisced about this later to a, a website called science fiction studies. And he said, I felt so obligated that in 1973, when we were discussing a film version of Japan sinks, I gave Toho the movie rights with almost no conditions. I think they paid 1.5 million yen. Yeah. And that's not very much. No, it's not, especially for such a big hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember reading the book a couple of years ago. I got it. And I also read it in one night. I could not put it down. It was just, amazing to read there was so much and i and i can totally tell how this was a big hit in japan that i no doubt in my mind that it was such a popular phenomenon what i i think it says something see i saw the movie first and usually if i see the movie i won't go to the trouble to read the book but i i actually love this film so much i wanted to actually read the book that inspired it and there are quite a few differences which we'll we'll cover here in a bit um to return just to like the production, um, it was actually – well, it came out as the New Year's blockbuster in December of 1973. But initially, they were actually eyeing it for March of 1974. And that would have been kind of ironic because then Submersion of Japan would have come out the same year as the famous 1974 earthquake movie. So it's really a good move on Toho's part that they've released it in 1973 so people can look at those, those years – and connect the dots that, no, Submersion of Japan was not inspired by Earthquake. Um, it actually came out before it. Um, Toho, they put a lot of thought into it. There were four different script drafts written, and they also had a lot of consultation by geophysicists um, and seismic engineers, oceanographers, all sorts of Japanese experts, and even uh, the special effects director, Turiyoshi Nakano, he joked that he became a quote-unquote expert on earthquakes, and he said that he had read more than 70 books on earthquakes to prep for the film. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Yeah. So to talk about some of the 
the uh, the differences between the book and the movie. Um, you know, as with anything, it's basically faithful to the book. You know, it follows that same outline. Basically, all you miss is just um, a few extra scenes or some characters that got cut out. So one of our first big differences in the book and the movie was uh, they had a very significant scene early in the book that had our main, our main character, Onodera. Uh, he witnesses the volcanic eruption that mysteriously sinks the island, you know, because in the film, what sets off uh, the plot is this island mysteriously sinks under the ocean. And oddly enough, we don't see that in the film. It's only spoken of, but um, in the early script drafts, we were supposed to actually see the island sink, and for whatever reason, they cut it out. But um, that was one of the the bigger scenes cut, you know, from the movie that was in the book. Um, they also, Onodera and the other investigators were supposed to talk to some Japanese and Polynesian fishermen who who were actually on the island when it sunk and made it off before it did. The movie, you know, has to condense the action, so there are only two trips down below in the Watatsumi sub- submarine, but in the book there are three trips down below. And what I think is funny is in the book there's kind of a quasi kaiju. Uh, because they see a 100-foot-long stingray. Um, so I would guess Toho took that out for either budgetary reasons, or maybe they didn't want to confuse people into thinking this was one of their monster movies and they took that out. That's what I would probably assume. Okay, now here's the biggest difference between the book and the movie. It cuts out uh, a minor character who is actually very important. So big plot in the movie is that Onodera is getting into an arranged marriage with a woman named Rico. And this is all through Onodera's boss, Yoshimura. He sets him up with Rico Abe. Um, now, before they go to Rico's house in the book, they have a, a scene where Yoshimura and Onodera go to a club. And at the club is a hostess named Mako. And uh, she and Onodera kind of have a little flirtatious relationship. And um, it's kind of Komatsu's way of showing us, you know, that she's important and we need to remember this character. And uh, anyways, after talking to Mako and uh, Onodera leaves the club with uh, Yoshimura and he takes him to Rico's house and they meet and they connect pretty well. And, you know, as in the film, Onodera and Rico have sort of, they have a romance, but it is an arranged marriage, which is a very Japanese concept uh, compared to what Americans would be used to in the 1970s. You know, that was more of an outdated concept. So, yeah. And that was something that's definitely taken out of a tidal wave, but we'll talk about that later. Um, But what I'm getting at, I'm trying to, I'm trying to just inform people who haven't read the book, how different the ending is. So again, I was talking about this hostess named Mako. And at the end of the book, uh, Onodera, you know, as in the film, he he's he's lost track of Rico. He doesn't know where she is. And, um, you know, of course, this is in the days before cell phones when it was easy to keep in touch. You know, he's totally lost track of his fiance, And um, he's he's doing his part to rescue every Japanese citizen that he possibly can. And he rescues these hikers in the Alps. And one of them turns out to be Mako. And one of our one of the last times we see Onodera in the book is he's he's caught up in this accident in the Alps and kind of lose track of him for a while. And then Komatsu has this epilogue in the book, and it's like supposed to be a surprise twist ending. Now, the film ends um, with Onodera and Rico in these trains on opposite sides of the world. We don't know where they are. We just know that Onodera is on a train and Rico's on a train, but they're not on the same train. Right. Um, now the the book definitely has a surprise ending because we Odera wakes up, he thinks he's on a ship, and he's got a woman there, and he refers to the woman as his wife, and you know you you're thinking oh he finally found Rico, but he didn't. Um, Onodera has for some reason married Mako the hostess, and he's on a train with her somewhere, and he doesn't know where Rico is, and that's how the novel ends. So yeah, it's I remember very that different now. from the film. Yeah, mm-hmm. very different. But yeah, the, I I was rather shocked at how faithful the book is, though, or the movie is to the book. Mostly beat for beat, a lot of things from the book. I like it when a movie does that. And there are some movies where I read the book and I'm like, man, this should have been so much more like the book. The way I saw this movie was I saw the the Japanese version of it, the the original Submersion of Japan, but there weren't any subtitles. I think it was because I was waiting on the book to arrive. And then I read the book, and then I got a hold of the movie with subtitles, and then watched that. And then I was like, oh, okay, yeah. But 
I was really happy with the movie once I saw it with subtitles because it, it was so incredibly accurate and faithful to the book. And Komatsu as well was very happy. He he has a quote in G-Fan. He says, the movie was quite faithful to the original story and I was quite satisfied. So even mm-hmm. he uh, acknowledged that, which can be kind of rare with authors sometimes. And he mentioned uh, the scene that he was really disappointed that was cut. And I, it's kind of a minor scene. Um, it's an odd scene. Um, we remember there's a character in the book and the movie. His name is Prince Watari or the old man. Yeah. Uh, he has a handmaiden named uh, Hanai. And mm-hmm. uh, Komatsu said that his biggest regret was they didn't have the scene where um, Japan's about to sink and Watari is telling Hanai you know, to leave, go have children. And she uh, she almost wants to stay with Watari and die, but he convinces her to go. And she mentions how she needs to change clothes. And Watari asks if he can watch her and dress one more time before he dies. And that was the scene <laughs> that uh, Komatsu was so disappointed they didn't put into the film. <laughs> That's interesting. Does she smile like ever in this movie? I don't recall. I, I haven't seen I it quite so. as many times as you have. I don't think I've. I discovered this film late in life. I was I was thirty when I finally saw it. Yeah, I only saw it a couple of years ago, and I was just uh, I was really amazed with the special effects and just how well put together the story was. But it's I don't think she ever smiles in this movie. I think I I was sort of waiting for like. A, the, there are a couple movies that have done this. I think Chaplin did it first, but it was one of the ones where the, the character smiles at the very end, and that's like the last thing you see. <laughs> I was sort of waiting for somebody to do Chaplin and uh, and have her like smile at the very end, but there was nothing to smile about at the end of this movie. There really wasn't. This is definitely not one of those movies that you get Sekizawa to write the script and, and have oh. like, <laughs> comedic things happening. Definitely don't need... Sakazawa with his little light touches on this. This is a, it's a pretty bleak, pretty bleak movie. And oddly enough, it's not what I would call depressing. I guess it stands back far enough to be able to be objective. The destruction alone is enough. The music could have had so much more depression and doom in it, but it didn't. And I, I really love the soundtrack by Sato. It, he composed some really good music for this. It could have been a lot thicker, and, and the depression in the movie and the book could have been a lot thicker too. I didn't read it. I don't know if you've re- I don't know if you've read it either. But the the book World War Z. No. Uh-uh. This book is apparently really good. I want to read it, but it's it, it's almost like a, a disaster more than it is a zombie movie. It's treated like a virus outbreak, you know, and so, so like it's, it's, the story is just it follows around various characters as this disaster unfolds. I think it would probably be sort of like something Komatsu would actually have written. It's just about the events unfolding. Like the, this movie could have been so much more dramatic. It could have involved so much more human drama. It could have involved you know, Onodera, you know, us staring at Onodera going through emotions. It's giving us a a matter of fact thing because people who are watching it are already feeling enough. There are a lot of other movies, disaster movies that there's a lot more human drama involved. To me, it's more about the disaster itself, the totality and, and the scale of it more than it is about all of these relationships and all and like emphasizing the drama. This does not emphasize the drama as much. And instead it, it emphasizes the events and the efforts to try to save Japan and the evacuation. There's a lot of ground that's covered. They explain so much stuff to us it's about how earthquakes work and how tecton- plate tectonics works and just all of these really good explanations to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. And I appreciate that this movie did that. Everything you just said really reminded me of how different this movie is from Deathquake in 1980, also by Toho. Have you have you seen that one? I've I heard of it and read about it. It looks really good. Okay, so you and I had a conversation earlier about Earthquake and the melodrama and Earthquake with Charlton Heston and his wife and his mistress. Um, what's really funny is Toho's Deathquake movie from 1980 also has a main character who has a wife and a mistress and there's a lot it's really more about that melodrama than it is the earthquake and so it's more like a traditional 
disaster movie um, in that sense, which I think is funny. So I do want to take just a second to talk about Deathquake because some of the very small abandoned uh, concepts from the Submersion of Japan movie actually made their way into Deathquake years later. So in 1980, you know, Toho had kind of quit doing so many effects films, and they remembered what a big hit Submersion of Japan was, and they wanted to do another one, and so they, they did Deathquake, which is also based upon a novel, but not a, not a Saki Okamatsu novel. But what I think is funny is Submersion of Japan, the novel, it has a scene where, where an airplane is landing just as the earthquake occurs, and the ground upheaves, and it breaks this jumbo jet in two. And it was a really amazing scene, you know, that I, it was kind of a shame it wasn't in Submersion of Japan, but it is in Deathquake. So I have to make an educated guess that, you know, that was a scene maybe they wanted to do for Submersion of Japan. And since they didn't do it, they inserted it into Deathquake. And I also know the Submersion of Japan script had a scene where the prime minister um, is on a golf course and he's getting briefed on you know this impending trag this impending uh, disaster and that scene also was cut from submersion and for whatever reason they moved it into deathquake in 1980 so just some funny little similarities and you could kind of consider deathquake to be like an inferior little remake of submersion of japan not not a bad movie by any means it's just submersion of japan is such a masterpiece you know deathquake is kind of it's just not as good of a movie by comparison but I, I think I got us kind of off topic there. But um, that's funny that you mentioned that because there is a deleted scene from Earthquake with exactly that at the towards the beginning of the movie. We're shown this couple that's on this airplane. What's going on here? Why are they? You know, because at the beginning of the movie, they're sort of just loading up all this earthquake fodder and, and all these people to you know have horrible things happen to them, and sort of just getting everybody's getting in line. The plane is landing, and then the the earthquake happens, and the ground upheaves, and they have to... It's not a very well-filmed scene. It's really drawn out, and the actual moment that this happens is like 30 seconds, probably. That's something like that would, would take to happen. But they, they're they able to put the engine power back up, and I think what happens is, is that the plane takes back off again, and they're able to escape it. It's funny that uh, Deathquake had the scene back there, and it was originally planned for Submersion of Japan, too, because Earthquake actually had a deleted scene with this happening. That's funny. Apparently, I need to watch Earthquake, because there's a lot of similarities between it and Deathquake that I just had no idea existed before I talked to you. Yeah, I, I liked Earthquake. I, I It was actually probably one of my favorite 70s disaster movies from the United States. And it might be that Deathquake... Since it's towards the, you know, it, it's in 1980, so it's already, you know, like late 70s was when a lot of these were going to hell. But this, I think maybe Deathquake is kind of like a Japanese response to a whole bunch of these disaster movies that happen in America. And they and that's maybe one reason why there's more drama in it is it's because, because yeah, uh, I think it's, it's like a it's like a response or a, a sort of a sort of meant to fit in more with the uh, the traditional disaster movies from America and what people had gotten used to watching. That's, that's very interesting. I'm going to have to see Deathquake. Yeah, I think you would definitely enjoy it. Just um, And there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say stock footage, but I think they're like alternative unused effects take, takes from uh, Submersion of Japan that Juryoshi Nakano put into Deathquake, so it's got a lot of that footage in there, just alternate angles and things like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, Earthquake uses some stock footage from a couple of other movies or television shows too, and so like, but it, it's still really good. Unless you saw like every movie from around back then, you would not be able to tell. Seventies movies that have stock footage in them, they I think audiences now they're a little bit too hard on them. Uh, yeah. These disaster movies from the 70s are an amazing topic. Yeah, and well, and speaking of those, you know, we've been talking about Earthquake, and the U.S. edited version of Submersion of Japan was called Tidal Wave, and it came out in 1975, and naturally people thought it was a ripoff of Earthquake, but it wasn't. Um, just to re reiterate again, Submersion of Japan was released uh, in Japan in December of 1973. Nine million people went to go see it. That's actually as many people that went to go see Mothra in 1961, so it was a huge hit. 
Yeah, their highest grossing film of the 1970s, I believe. Their highest grossing film, if adjusted for inflation, until Godzilla vs. Mothra in 1992. So it's just, it's a huge movie. It's just Western fans don't really know as much about it because it didn't have Godzilla or any monsters in it. But to talk about the the unfortunate Americanization of that film, which really eliminates um, the more you know Japanese aspects of the film, um, it was picked up by Roger Corman's New World Pictures uh, in 1974. You know he had seen what a big hit Earthquake was, and he saw somewhere you know the Japanese cut, Submersion of Japan, and he decided, well, let's buy that, and then let's make it more appealing to Westerners. And how he decided to do that was basically copy what they did for Gojira, you know, Godzilla, King of the Monsters with Raymond Burr. Um, so he, Corman got a, not a big American star, but he was, <laughs> as you told me earlier, Brian, I didn't know this. Uh, he got an yeah, actor Lauren from Green. Earthquake. Yeah, Lauren Green. Yeah, and that's probably maybe one reason why they thought that that this was a a bad, you know, remake or whatever of Earthquake from Japan is because Lauren Green was in both of these things. He was in Earthquake too. Exactly. And then and I didn't know that until you told me that because again, I've never seen Earthquake, so that's a very interesting factoid I didn't know and I'm going to add that to a book that I'm working on right now before I forget, but um yeah, yeah, Lauren Green was in Earthquake, but he's more familiar to most people from the television western series Bonanza. He was the oh, lead yeah. on that. And it, you know, it was basically the same process of as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. They did the filming for Tidal Wave in two to three days. That was it. The new director of the American footage, he wrote about twenty pages of dialogue, and then Roger Corman rented out a hotel suite for the weekend. That way, they didn't have to build sets. G Fan actually did an interview with the cameraman from Tidal Wave. His name is Eric Saarinen. I, I hope I said that right. This is his quote from G-Fan about the new scenes they filmed to insert in the tidal wave. He says, it was just dialogue, you know, and it was the stuff you'd cut back and forth from the Japanese cast somewhere else or to the tidal wave or whatever. There was a sort of revolving door of fairly well-known actors that would come in and take different parts of generals or, you know, the American interests. And he also goes on to say, Lauren Green was a total professional and was very well liked amongst our small crew. So, I've actually seen Tidal Wave. It's not like Godzilla King of the Monsters exactly. Um, it's not like Lauren Green interacts with uh, the lead, which would be Hiroshi Fujioka, I believe that's his name, or or Tetsuro Tamba. He doesn't interact with him. Basically, Lauren Green, he plays uh, an, a U.S. ambassador. He speaks during scenes uh, at the... Uh, united nations and there are like a few scenes that they edit green into that are in the japanese version that are set at the united nations like they edit green into those but that's about it and he doesn't have a whole lot of screen time um he doesn't show up until the 40 minute mark and tidal wave is only 80 minutes to begin with so he doesn't show up until halfway until the movie's over wow yeah (laughs) And again, it's just a very watered-down version of Submersion of Japan. It's, again, over, let's see, 71 minutes total were cut. That's a lot of footage. Of course, most of the disaster footage is intact, basically. Um, But a lot of the more Japanese scenes to do with Japanese culture and the Japanese sphere of of their culture disappearing once the land disappears, you know, that was cut out. Um, There's some restructuring, kind of similar to how the U.S. version of uh, Ghidra, the three-headed monster, moved around on a lot of footage. There's some of that. Um, I mean, we could talk the whole podcast about the differences, but uh, which I don't think we want to do, but a lot of differences. And it definitely, ooh, it definitely ruined the movie. You know, because I can watch the original Godzilla and watch King of the Monsters and see how King of the Monsters is still a pretty good movie on its on its own right. Yeah, it's still not that bad. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that about Tidal Wave, though. It's not very <laughs> good. Um, Roger Ebert really didn't like it. Um, <laughs> I have his review here in front of me. Uh, Roger Ebert, you know, and again, he didn't see the Japanese version. All he saw was this U.S. version. And this is what Ebert had to say. Actually, I want to preface this with Roger Ebert loved 
Super Inframan, which also came out in 1975, which is a really wonky, crazy movie. He he gave Super Inframan super high marks. Was that the one from Hong Kong? Yes, it's... Oh, yeah, I saw that when I was a kid. I loved that. <laughs> see, I, I didn't see that one as a kid, so I can't say I loved it. Um, I saw it as an adult, you know, so to me it was pretty goofy. Yeah, it, it is just goofy if you're not <laughs> if you're not the right age. It's, yeah, it, it's sort of like one of those things where you, you had to have been there. <laughs> so, again, this is what Ebert says, you know, the guy who loved Super Inframan. This is what he says about Tidal Wave. Bad movies are getting really awful these days. It seems like only yesterday we were savoring bombs like The Vengeance of She and Godzilla vs. The Smog Monster. Movies so terrible they achieved a sort of greatness. I was hoping Tidal Wave would be a movie like that. When publicity photographs arrived in the mail a few weeks ago, I was heartened by the sight of the staples holding together the cardboard skyscrapers. I just want to interject and say I do not think they look like cardboard skyscrapers. I never saw any staples. I think Ebert's just no. being overly cruel here. Yeah. Um, the miniatures are great, so I think he, that's a really unfair swipe at it. Um, anyways, though, Ebert's acting like he was excited by this fact, and I'll continue his little review here. He says, here was a movie with a real lack of promise. It even looked like a good bet to outflank King Kong versus Godzilla. But Tidal Wave let me down. It is purely and simply a wretched failure, a feeble attempt to paste together inept special effects filmed in Japan and Lorne Green filmed in America to his everlasting regret, I'll bet. And he ends his review by stating, the movie never ends, but if you wait long enough, it gets to a point where it's over. So I, I really oh wonder what Ebert would have thought if he saw the actual original cut, which you know really is a very good film. Well, that is, it's, it is kind of like what American remakes of Japanese movies like this are like it, it takes out the meaning. A lot of the meaning of the original Godzilla got taken out for King of the Monsters, and a lot of the meaning from uh, Return of Godzilla got taken out for Godzilla '85. Uh, getting back to the the guy that did the cinematography for uh, Tidal Wave, uh, Eric Saarinen, he is the son of Aero Saarinen. Aero Saarinen was the Finnish American architect who designed the Washington Dulles Airport, the TWA Flight Center in New York City. He also designed the Gateway Arch. He's a very well-known architect. And I, I find it amazing that uh, Eric Sarnan actually did Tidal Wave. But uh, Eric Sarnan is a, he was a cinematographer, and uh, he's, he's still alive now. But uh, he, he has uh, done the cinematography for quite a few movies. But yeah, he, that's, uh, that's Eero Sarnan's son. I, I do want to see it sometime just to be able to say that I did. And, and it's pretty short, too, compared to uh, Submersion of Japan. So uh, I, did, I do want to get, get through that sometime. Uh, some of the other kind of needless things I did or ah, needless things that they did in the editing process, you know, they have the character of Dr. Tadokoro. For some reason, they renamed him Mr. Tanaka. Onodera became Onoda. And they do change, in addition to cutting out a lot of scenes, they change the dialogue. I think it's kind of funny, again, this difference between Japanese arranged marriages and how people in the United States would see that. I know they have a scene where Onodera in the Japanese version, he straight up tells Rico over the phone, he's like, I don't know if I'm in love with you, but I think it, it may not be too bad to spend the rest of my life with you. And that like thrills her, you know, to her, that's high romance, but... I think they knew that for American audiences, they'd be like, wait, what? Did he just say that to her? And so like, they redub it to become much more romantic and passionate and things like that. One of the really great scenes in the Japanese version is the final scene between Tetsuro Tamba's prime minister and Dr. Tadakoro. And Tadakoro gives this wonderful kind of eulogy to Japan as it's sinking. And of course, they cut that out of Tidal Wave. It's not in there. Really summarized the film and it something about submersion of japan is i wouldn't say it has like the traditional climax you would expect you know it, the big special effects set pieces are kind of already over by the time that we get to the end of the film so to me tadokoro's eulogy is kind of like the closing remark to summarize the whole film and to cut that out is really awful and then the other bad thing that tidal wave does is the title because it's not really about a tidal wave it's about an earthquake they just couldn't yeah. call it earthquake yeah yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> there is a title. See, and this this gives you a false expectation as well because there is 
uh, tsunami scene towards the end of the movie, but the tsunami scene really isn't anywhere near as fantastic as the uh, the Tokyo earthquake scene. Right. You know, so I mean, it gives the audience a false expectation for a tidal wave movie when it really isn't that. In the terror of the lost Tokusatsu films, you mentioned how Akira Kurosawa was almost the director for this, or at least was being considered. I think that would have been utterly amazing because I'm a huge Kurosawa fan. But if if he had been associated with this production, it probably would have been even more expensive than it already was. It also it would have been amazing though to see what he could have done with a a movie like this. Absolutely. The guy that plays the prime minister in this movie, he is in, he's in both of the movies on Kaiju vision this month because he's in submersion of Japan. And he's also in the prophecies of Nostradamus in a very, uh, very prominent role. So, okay. We, we had a private conversation earlier joking about Charlton Heston being like the king of the U S disaster movies. Well, yeah. yeah Tetsuro so Tetsuro Tamba. Yeah. He, I mean, he was basically the Charlton Heston of the Japanese disaster movies. Um, if that name sounds familiar to, to Westerners, probably where you saw him was You Only Live Twice, the James Bond film where he played uh, Tiger Tanaka. So he uh, he was a pretty big star. But after Submersion of Japan, he became the go-to disaster star, not just for Toho, because Tambo was also in Toei's uh, disaster movie Bullet Train, um, which I, I would like to see one day, but I haven't. I feel like this is a good opportunity to really talk about how Submersion of Japan kind of changed the landscape for the good and the bad as far as Godzilla movies go. Because I'll go out on a limb here and say we probably have a lot of Godzilla fans listening. So, uh, 1973, I believe it was Toho's 40th anniversary year. 1973 was a big anniversary year for them, and they had certain productions earmarked as special anniversary productions. And one of them was... uh, Core of the Wolf, which was also adapted from a novel. And one of them was, believe it or not, Godzilla vs. Megalon, which was probably a surprise because it was basically the cheapest Godzilla movie of that time ever. We always talk about Godzilla vs. Megalon and how low budget is budgeted it was, and then we compare it to Submersion of Japan, which is so lavish. But what's funny is you might notice the very next year, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, was obviously a much higher budgeted feature. And the reason that was, uh, I hear from uh, a Teroshi Nakano interview, I don't remember which one it was, but he said that Submersion of Japan was so successful that they were actually able to pump more money into the effects budget for the next year's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. And furthermore, um, they also used a few outtakes or B-roll footage um, from Submersion of Japan, I believe in regards to uh, the oil refinery attack in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. So that's kind of an interesting way, yeah. Now, that's the good way that it impacted the Godzilla series, but the bad way is um, Toho basically learned that our money isn't in Godzilla anymore. Toho was making a lot of money off of Godzilla in terms of tie-in merchandising, but they weren't selling as many tickets to Godzilla movies. You know, the 70s Godzilla films would be lucky to go over 1 million tickets sold. Yeah, and Terror of Mechagodzilla did quite badly. Yeah, well, That's right. Yeah, 1975, and that was that's why it was the last one for so long. Um, and Toho's big hits started to become disaster movies. I would, actually, in Japan, they don't call them disaster movies. They called them panic movies. And this trend... Kind of continued. Um, so in 1974, that's when Great Prophecies of Nostradamus came out, and it too was based off of a novel, and that's why I think Tomoyuki Tanaka he wanted to replicate this uh, success of the Submersion of Japan novel adaptation. So that's that's why he adapted um, Great Prophecies of Nostradamus, and also uh, we you know we kind of already covered this, but Toho had purchased the rights to Espy as in. A Spy with ESP. Um, that was by Komatsu from the 1960s. And they suddenly remembered, oh, we have this other Komatsu movie. Why don't we just make it? Because his name is a hot commodity right now. Yeah, I really want to see that. I, I endorse it. I think it's very good. Uh, Japanese version, as always, much better than the uh, U.S. cut. But um, Toho's Panic movie thing, it actually kind of 
petered out by 1975. They produced a film called uh, Tokyo Bay in Flames, also by a novel. I don't know if it was a hit or not. All I know is for some reason Toho quit doing Godzilla movies in 1975, and they also quit doing their disaster movies until 1980s Deathquake movie. So I don't know what their deal was. But I do know Sakio Komatsu, you know, he, he was one of those, uh, you get one hit movie from his ideas, and then you get like three or four movies that weren't a hit. Um, that doesn't include East Spy. East Spy was a big hit. But Komatsu's other sci-fi movies, are, uh, they weren't really big hits. Um, his other... His other ones were actually very expensive flops. Uh, in 1980, there was Day of Resurrection, or Virus as it's known here in the West. A, a highly budgeted film. It was a flop. They had Komatsu's Sayonara Jupiter, also a, bu- a box office bomb. And finally, in 1987, his last sci-fi film adaptation, uh, Tokyo Blackout, about an alien cloud that comes over Tokyo. If I'm not mistaken, that also wasn't really a very big hit. So, you know, it's another example of where you get one or two hits out of Komatsu and then the studios keep trying his properties, but they're not always a, a success, you know, which is kind of interesting. Right, yeah. And uh, the season finale, season two finale for Kaiju Vision will be uh, Sinar Jupiter. And uh, yeah, I read, I've read uh, some about this movie already and it is it was a pretty big flop. Yeah, and oh, just as, a, as an aside uh, per our, our conversation earlier, there is a cut of Sayonara Jupiter without the dolphin. And it's it was the TV cut. They actually removed all those silly scenes with the dolphin, and it's it's tonally a little more consistent. Oh, I imagine that would uh, even it out a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. I think the last thing we can do is the TV series. That's right. Yeah, something I forgot to mention, too, in addition to these other Komatsu film adaptations, there was also a Submersion of Japan TV series which I've never seen. I would like to. I don't believe it's supposed to be in continuity with the film. I think it's like a TV adaptation of the book. So it's not supposed, it's not like, like Marvel's agents of shield and the Avengers movies. It's, it's two different continuities, just the same property. Yeah. And I think the, the finale of the TV series was actually the, the Tokyo earthquake. And so, it, but in, in the movie it was actually in the middle of the movie. So yeah, it's pretty different. And then uh, Komatsu didn't even see it for a while, and then when he did, he said it wasn't very good. Yeah, that's what I—that's what he's told science fiction studies. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he said. So I, I would think if I wrote a book and it got adapted into a TV series, I would find the time to watch it, but who knows? Yeah, I th- think you would. Well, there is that sort of phenomenon of when, like a, when an author writes a book that's really successful and then it gets made into a, a movie and then the the author watches the movie and then he's like, oh, this is terrible. Don't watch yeah. it. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's not faithful to my vision of the movie. Don't. I've seen that replayed so many, that scenario redone so many different times. Yeah. And one other last aside we can take before, before you move on to talking about the film's themes is there was almost a sequel. You know, in Japan oh, yeah. it was called yeah, Sinking of Japan continuation, but it was actually even reported uh, in the U.S. in Famous Monsters of Film Land. They called it After Japan Sinks. And uh, I don't really see how you do a sequel to a movie like that when Japan has already sunk and what are you going to do next? But yes, they talked about doing a sequel for about five years, I think. I want to say some of the trouble Toho had with filming Nessie with Hammer kind of sunk some of their other projects. Um the other problem with the Japan Sink sequel was Komatsu couldn't really come up with a concept, but he did in the 2000s. He finally wrote a sequel, and its uh, I don't think it's the sequel they would have made back in the 1970s because Komatsu's sequel is very futuristic. Japan constructs these huge floating islands and creates a new version of the Japanese islands, which to me totally doesn't fit with that film that we saw from 1973. So I really don't think that would have been the plot of the sequel had it actually been made. But there is a sequel. Um, it hasn't been translated into English yet, but it is out there. So Definitely doesn't seem uh, like it would be a very interesting continuation tonally. I think the only things I've heard about it is as far as like the stuff people really want to see, which is the disaster scenes, is that I believe the volcanoes would start erupting 
something elsewhere in the world like they did in Japan and there's like the threat of a new ice age or something and then the other big focus of uh, the sequel at the time was how are the uh, the Japanese people being assimilated into these foreign countries and how are they losing their culture and this and that yeah and that would be kind of depressing like that like it and it wouldn't have very much disaster stuff in it like it that's probably what I would assume a, a sequel would do is actually just continue the the events from the first movie and it it would essentially just be that it would be them struggling with assimilation and contacting each other again and and getting back together but that's really just that doesn't make for a very compelling story really unless you have something else going on if if you have volcanoes start popping up in Nevada and Arizona where they all moved to you know like they just <laughs> Like, but that, yeah. doesn't make, that, just, that doesn't make any sense either. You know, like you can't. Just, it's not like you can have the disaster just follow them. You see that that reminds me of the sequels to the bad romantic movies, where you can't think of what to do for the sequel other than you break up the couple so they can get back together again. Like, okay, the Japanese move. Here's an, another disaster to follow them. I I think it was better. There was no sequel. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a really interesting talk and uh i've really enjoy having you on and this has been this has been good because this is such a huge movie and it's one of the reasons why i decided to do toho tokusatsu movies to begin with for this season i just absolutely love this movie and thank you for giving everybody a lot more background on this that i either didn't know or couldn't have provided and and uh, it's it was great to f- give more of the story about this movie and uh your, the book that you talk about the submersion of Japan a lot is Terror of the Lost Tokusatsu Films. Uh, and uh, I got that right here on the table with me. And it's uh, very good and full of really interesting facts about all of these tokusatsu movies. And there are so many great things going on in these movies. And like earlier in the season, we did The Last War, you know, no kaiju. Uh, it's really good to have you on and to, and to discuss these movies because uh, they're they're great and definitely everybody should, should see submersion of Japan. I I've seen it so many times. I sometimes just pop it in just to have it on when I'm doing something else. So it's been great. And your newest book that is out this year is Kong unmade the lost films of skull Island. If you want to learn more about Kong and the run up to the Godzilla versus Kong movie next year, definitely get a copy of that. And thank you, Brian, for letting me talk about one of my favorite films, because Submersion of Japan is definitely, in my opinion, one of the best. So thank you. And uh, I will be moving on next to the chronological rundown featuring up next. Now I'm going to move forward with the chronological run through. The titles of this film are unforgettable. This is perhaps my favorite part of the soundtrack, too. It feels almost like a Japanese interpretation from parts of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. It gives us the recent history of plate tectonics, starting 200 million years ago. The plates had been moving much earlier than this, 3 to 3.5 billion years ago. The theory of plate tectonics wasn't fully accepted by the scientific community until 1967, which is only six years before this film was released. Scientists, though, had conceived of this idea much earlier. 200 million years ago was the Jurassic period in the Mesozoic era, when Pangaea split in two. The second part of this animation is 150 million years ago, showing the end of the Jurassic period when the split was complete. Next is 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, where we see the Atlantic Ocean widening. At 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, the Atlantic Ocean is much wider. The globe moves to the area of Japan and fast forwards to 30 million years ago in the Cenozoic era and the Oligocene epoch. Then 10 million years ago, during the Miocene epoch, Japan is still connected to Asia. Going forward to 3 million years ago in the Pliocene era, the northern territories of Japan are the only areas left connected to Asia. We're forwarded to the present, and the music sounds like an earthquake is about to happen. I swear this last part of the music, when the title shows up, the very loud part of the music at the end, that gives me goosebumps and makes my hair stand on end every time I hear it. The titles are so effective in giving us the mood of the movie. It's telling us, so much has happened before now, 
and so drastic over time, but what is going to happen next? And the titles give us exactly that, at least according to the story. The rest of the title sequence is a series of films of present-day Japan. The first one is a perfect one, a Series Zero Shinkansen train with Mount Fuji in the background. This title sequence is also effective because it's showing us all of Japan and how it will be gone. All these little clips we see are people having fun at festivals, people going to a racetrack, the baseball game, playing games, going to car shows, shipping cars for export, going to the beach and the cityscape, the subway stations filled with people, going to the water park, the sprawling streets. This type of photography reminds the audience of how busy Japan is and how many people are there and how dense the population can be. This part of the movie reminds me of the scenic videos from this show that are on YouTube. Now that I've done the titles, I want to pose a question to you. What if we just had the title sequence, and then the first thing that we see is the Tokyo earthquake, the second Great Kanto earthquake that happens? Would you prefer that, or would you prefer having the warm-up scenes that are leading to it? Because there's quite a few of them. I couldn't imagine just going to the quake right away. But that's why the quake scenes are such a big deal. We have the meaning and the gravity that leads up to it. We need the slow build because that makes the disastrous events more meaningful. Just like in Earthquake 1974, there are four shocks to the big one. First, we're taken to Misaki Port, which is in the city of Miura, located at the tip of the Miura Peninsula. Miura is at the edge of the Uraga Channel, which is what inexperienced people would think is the entrance to Tokyo Bay, but is actually a channel that leads into the actual Tokyo Bay. The movie wastes no time in having our two main characters introduced to each other. Onodera meets Dr. Tadokoro. The characters are played by Hiroshi Fujioka and Keiju Kobayashi, respectively. Fujioka is most well-known from the Kamen Rider series. He played Kamen Rider 1. The original TV series went from 1971 to 1973. It's an action-adventure story of a motorcycle-riding cyborg. The superhero's costume looks like a grasshopper sort of motif. He fights this evil organization founded by former Nazis called Shocker. The hero's name is Takeshi Hongo. Hiroshi Fujioka is a popular figure in Japan because of his work. Keiju Kobayashi was in 250 films during his career. Listeners will remember him from The Return of Godzilla from 1984, where he played Prime Minister Mitamura. He was in Sanjuro from 1963, directed by Kurosawa, too. Earlier in his career, he was in quite a few salaryman movies, particularly the company president comedies that Toho made. This first scene introduces us to the Watatsumi No. 1 underwater vehicle. From the beginning, Tadokoro is intense and concerned. He's driven to know more. He has a single-minded purpose to find out what's happening on the ocean floor. Everyone is puzzled, a little weirded out by his forwardness. When the team of scientists are looking at the underwater footage, they conclude something's not right, that this island didn't disappear into the ocean because of volcanic activity, more like a landslide. Tanakoro is staring intensely and saying very little until he says he has no idea and that they'll have to check the Japan Trench. The Japan Trench stretches from the Kuril Islands to the Izu Islands along the east coast of northern Honshu. It regularly produces magnitude 7 earthquakes as well as tsunami. The 9.0 earthquake and resulting tsunami in 2011, known as the Tohoku earthquake, was produced by the Japan Trench subduction zone. It goes as deep as 26,398 feet or over 8,000 meters. When this movie was made, the most recent earthquake that had occurred was an 8.2 or 8.3 magnitude quake in 1968 called the Tokachi earthquake. It produced a 20-foot tsunami. It caused significant damage and cut off communications between Honshu and Hokkaido. When they reach 8,000 feet, which is only 46 meters from the bottom, our characters are hit by a current, the most dynamic current they've ever seen. When they get jostled by this big force, they have to brace themselves, and they notice this muddy cloud. They launch a flare and they decide to go down at Tadakoro's insistence. So they measure that there's this current, and it has high density, it's north to south instead of east-west. 
what they're talking about here is a turbidity current. It's when high-density water, in other words, water with a high concentration of sediment in it, a lot of the time it's clay, and also a higher salt concentration, is a current not because of the water, but because of the sediment flow. Turbidity currents don't happen just underwater, but also when volcanoes unleash pyroclastic flows, lava flows, lahars, and where avalanches occur. It's the density of the material plus the gravity. It's not as much about the water or air driving the force, it's the density of the sediment or other rock that's in the air or the water. The sediment flow starts higher up and then it has a snowballing effect that increases the speed and the density of the flow as it keeps going, hence the current. The sediment that's in the water that's deposited is called turbidite. The disaster in this movie is referred to as a diastrophism. It's the first time I ran into this term, so I'll describe what that is. When there's a fault created, or if the Earth's crust folds, that is a diastrophism. It's when the Earth's crust deforms, dislocates, or distorts. And it's not about molten rock. This is the solid part of the crust we're talking about. Just a reminder, your geology midterm test will be on Friday and is 30% of your grade. In the next scene, Prime Minister Yamamoto arrives at the Kante, which is the name for the Prime Minister's residence. The Prime Minister is played by Tetsuro Tamba. He acted in movies for a very long time. I first saw him in You Only Live Twice, which is the Bond film from 1967. He played the part of Tiger Tanaka. I had also seen him in the 1964 film Kaidan, which is a marvelous film that you should see if you haven't seen it yet. He's also in a major role in Kaiju Vision's next film, The Prophecies of Nostradamus, from 1974. This is one of those movies where we spend quite a bit of time with the Prime Minister. The Return of Godzilla is another example of a story like this. His position in the story is interesting because, as he represents the Japanese people, he's also put in the same position as the audience from an educational standpoint. The Prime Minister has to learn about Earth's geology, but he's not a scientist. Like the audience, he understands the need to do something once he knows what's at stake. This character is effective because he cares about his country. He wants Japan to have a future, and he's put in a situation that very few would envy. He's in a position of power, but in many ways he's helpless, just like the people of Japan are helpless. He must accept that there's very little that he can do. Nineteen minutes in is when Prime Minister Yamamoto gets out of his car and the man opening the door for him is Haru Nakajima, who played Godzilla up through 1972. This was his very last role in a movie, in fact. Right away, the Prime Minister is greeted by his wife, and also by a woman named Yachan, whose husband worked eight years as a director for the Finance Ministry. The Prime Minister picks up Yachan's baby, and acts as a politician would, but also as a genuine caring person. He then gets this chilling look on his face, that's about what he might have to deal with in the future. Inside his mind, you can tell he's worried about what kind of a future this child will have. Ono is at his workplace, the business that he is a pilot for, and Tadokoro, driven as ever, calls him and asks him for the use of the submarine in the Japan Trench, but it's unavailable for a year. This establishes how urgent things are getting, and also how Japan is going to have to get more money and technology to do what's needed to find out what's going on. Around 20 minutes and 27 seconds into the movie is the cameo by Sakio Komatsu himself. He is the one who brings papers in to Yoshimura and then says hi to Onodera. Komatsu is known as the Arthur C. Clarke of Japan, and he even kind of looks like a Japanese version of Arthur C. Clarke. It's a cool cameo, and Onodera even smiles at him after Komatsu says hi. I like it. The scene after this is about Yoshimura taking Onodera to meet Reiko Abe, the daughter of a rich family. She's played by Ayumi Ishida. She is known as an idol, a singer, and an actress. She sang a song called Blue Light Yokohama, which currently is available for viewing on YouTube. She sang that song back in 1969. The discussion between Reiko and Onodera is remarkably similar to the discussion in the book. She's very forward, and she brings up marriage and children and she's very sexual in her overtures towards him. In the book, she actually says, you don't have anything against sex, do you? He's more reserved and unsure of if he wants to be with her or continue being a pilot and doing his own thing. In the book, on the beach, he takes her bikini off. 
it seems like her opulent lifestyle and upbringing has made her very open and matter-of-fact. The scene on the beach in the movie reminds me of the beach scene in From Here to Eternity, only a much rockier beach. And just like in the book, Mount Amagi erupts. Mount Amagi is on the Itsu Peninsula, which has a lot of mountains. The eruption, special effects-wise, looks good. It's particularly violent and fits in with what the story is conveying. In the book, the water on the beach recedes as they escape, which signals a tsunami. In the book, Mount Miharo, which is on the island of Itsuoshima, also erupts. Mount Miharo is the volcano that Godzilla ends up in at the end of The Return of Godzilla from 1984. In the following Shin Godzilla-esque scene, the Prime Minister realizes how helpless Japan is because it's so difficult to predict volcanoes and earthquakes. He asks one of the ministers about the meteorological agency's report on the Japan Trench, and the guy says, what do you mean? That's also like Shin Godzilla, the bureaucracy being caught off guard and having to react. However, the next scene is definitely not like Shin Godzilla, because the Prime Minister is sitting down and listening to scientists explain what's going on with Earth. We get our next geology lesson here about the crust, the mantle, the core, and so on. This scene is a big one because it's important that the audience understand how Earth's solid surfaces move around, and how there's convection in the mantle. And that's why there are trenches and mountain ranges. Having the audience get this is important. Not everyone knew about this, and it's not like they could just look it up on their smartphones. Even though the idea of Japan sinking into the ocean in a matter of a year or so is not realistic, the science behind it is realistic. It's realism, to be exact. There were actual scientific consultants who helped this movie immensely, including a seismic engineer, an oceanographer, a volcanologist, and a geophysicist. This geophysics lesson employs analogies such as comparing Earth to a soft-boiled egg and all kinds of visual aids. They even go into the details of continental drift, such as Pangaea and how the continents drifted apart. I'm fascinated by how the formation of supercontinents is actually a cycle and that in the future, continents will actually join each other again. The Mediterranean Sea may disappear because Africa is crashing into Europe, North America may crash back into Africa, and so what could happen is a supercontinent called Pangaea Ultima. Very interesting. There are plenty of variables with this, though. They then show a fantastic model of subduction zones with what looks like a silicone compound sliding underneath another one, and then the one on top of it slipping and causing an earthquake. This had to have been interesting to watch in 1973 in a theater, and there's definitely no American disaster movie that has done stuff this educational. Instead, we were treated to the drama of a man and his wife and his mistress like an earthquake. I don't mean to denigrate Earthquake, because it's a totally different kind of movie than this, and Earthquake is pretty good in its own right, but this movie is really making things understandable, and it conveys how these events occur. Finally, Tato Koro speaks up, and with his usual intensity, impresses upon the Prime Minister that something really bad could happen. He's putting off the other scientists who are trying to stay general and not sound alarmist. He says something big could happen, I don't know what yet, but you gotta keep researching. Then he's like, gotta go, see ya. Tadokoro having to come back to get his pen is a nice touch, kind of like saying this guy doesn't miss much, and if he does, he's right on top of it. The scene ends with the Prime Minister giving this look towards where Tadokoro left, and he's thinking inside, I better listen to this guy. The first Watari scene is a big deal. In the book, he's 100 years old, which puts his birth date at 1873 or so. It's pretty clear that the main idea is that he and Japan are connected. As he dies, Japan dies. Watari is played by Shogo Shimada. He died in 2004 at the age of 98, so he went on to live almost as long as Watari did. I recognize him from Tora Tora Tora, and others might recognize him from the movie Japan's Longest Day. Definitely a seasoned and experienced Japanese actor. This Watari character was so unexpected when I first saw this movie. It reminds me of the S.R. Haddon character from Contact by Carl Sagan. He was played by John Hurt in the movie version. Essentially, Watari is a rich man who is a huge power player in LDP politics. Though it isn't stated in the movie, Prime Minister Yamamoto is an LDP Prime Minister, and he may have been put into office by Watari himself. 
It reminds me of S.R. Haddon because we have a very powerful person approaching the most knowledgeable scientist and then trusting that person and their motivation. I don't know what the American equivalent of Watari would be, sort of like Charles Koch, only 100 years old, I don't know. His niece, who acts as a servant, is named Hanai. John mentioned her as the one who takes off her clothes at the end of the book. The Sato soundtrack here is very good. It's mysterious and ominous. Watari is asking about the swallows. The bird migrations have gotten all weird, and the swallows left Japan when this possible change in the magnetism of Earth occurred. It may also have to do with the flow of magma under the Earth, as well as shifts in magnetic polarity. This phenomenon is called geomagnetic reversal. The last time this happened was 780,000 years ago. On average, it happens every 453,551 years. The time it takes to do this is about 7,000 years for the four most recent reversals. The magnetic poles of Earth actually flip. Earth's magnetic south pole is at what's called the North Pole in the Arctic, while the magnetic North Pole is in Antarctica in the South Pole. So when the next reversal completes, the North Magnetic Pole will be at the North Pole, and the Magnetic South Pole will be in the South. The strength of the magnetic field has gone up and down over the years. It does get weaker, though, when the geomagnetic reversal is taking place. Currently, the magnetic poles are starting to move faster, and they are getting weaker. In the past 150 years, the magnetic field strength has decayed by about 10%. This does have to do with disasters because magma and so much rock down in Earth is magnetic. So earlier in the first presentation, they talked about the convection of the mantle and the subterranean current. It's possible the change in the magnetic field will have an effect on Earth's crust when the subterranean current is disrupted. That would imply issues with volcanoes and earthquakes. When the next geomagnetic reversal occurs, we could experience a mandatory period where radiation from space gets to Earth more because the magnetic field is much weaker. We could have satellites messed up because of the exposure to radiation, navigation systems could get affected, and the electrical grid could get significantly disrupted because of the havoc the magnetic field would be affecting the electricity flow on longer wires. The outer core of Earth is what generates the magnetic field. In southern Africa, there is a large mass of rock that is dense and cool, and what happens is that the rock sinks into the outer core and causes the magnetic field disruption because it disrupts the flow of the rock in the outer core. So this movie is implying that what Japan is going through is a magnetic anomaly occurring because of the geomagnetic reversal. The anomaly could have affected the birds and their migration patterns too. Tadakoro says it is terrestrial magnetism, and this could also affect the weather. It could also affect nature. There is some correlation between geomagnetic reversals and mass extinctions as well. There could be a mass bird or fish extinction, but also other mass extinctions in nature. Tadakoro says that he can't put it into words yet, but he has a really bad feeling. Watari is having his own private individual extinction because his health gets worse as Japan sinks. Then we have this great, simple visual aid. Tadakoro gets this thing called a newspaper, and he tears the newspaper and says, you can tell these two pieces were one piece before, right? He's demonstrating to us what Wagner saw when he looked at Africa and North and South America. Those two pieces used to be together when the supercontinent of Pangaea existed. Wagner knew that continental drift occurred. It was right there on the map, but he couldn't scientifically prove it. The movie is right about the story of Wagner, so again, we're in science fiction realm squarely. This is a sci-fi film first, and a disaster film second. That's another thing with this movie. The advantage of going by the book, for the most part, made the explanation scenes mostly necessary, and that's some time that builds up the suspense and the gravity. This next scene is a meeting, too, when things get really serious. Mimura, the secretary to the prime minister, a cognitive scientist, and a cabinet secretary, show up saying they're going to buy themselves a submarine, and they want Tadokoro to be on the staff working for it.
The cognitive scientist makes estimates for probabilities of natural phenomena, so that means it's a guy who could tell us when the next polarity reversal could take place, or when the sinking of Japan could happen, or when the next earthquake or volcanoes could even be. So we're heavy on government and scientists, and they're working together. At that moment, there's an earthquake, and a radio announcing the eruption of Mount Kirishima, or possibly it could be referring to a volcano under the sea near Kirishima. The following is what looks like an underwater volcano erupting. The small meeting after this is Onodera's boss getting mad because of Tadokoro getting Onodera to quit his job and join the private company that's doing the submarine work. The human drama is still not very big here as far as influence on the audience and screen time given to the drama, but this movie isn't just about the drama. In fact, Onodera meets another girl in the book and ends up with her at the end, and Reiko and Onodera get disconnected, just like in this movie. Her voicemail to Onodera in the next scene is where she reveals that her very wealthy father was killed in the Itsu earthquake, and so that's startling to everyone. It isn't totally in our faces in the script, but he's clearly chosen career over love and a relationship with Reiko. His work is too important and Japan is too important, so love and sex will have to wait. So this ship that they're on is the research center for getting readings and collecting data and making sense of it. Our two bureaucrats are discussing Watari and how he was the one who got Prime Minister Yamamoto into the presidency of the LDP, which is a different post than Prime Minister. The president of the LDP is the one in charge of the party. The land base in Kasumigawa is an Ibaraki prefecture. I assume they mean that they're at the JASDF base. Kasumigara is about halfway between downtown Tokyo and the Tokai nuclear power plant, which is featured in Godzilla 2000, and that is the closest power plant to Tokyo. The next scene with the bureaucrats in the helicopter going over Tokyo is like this depressing reverse mirror image of the Gorath helicopter scene, where those Space Defense Force personnel are singing their patriotic song as they fly through the city. Instead, this is sad, and it's pretty well implied that bad things are going to happen to Tokyo in the future. They're saying goodbye to Tokyo in their own way, and it's unfortunate when you have to realize that it's going to be destroyed, and there's nothing you can do about it. There isn't even any Godzilla threat in this movie, and yet Japan's going to get more destroyed than ever. All of Japan's going to get destroyed, and that's more than Godzilla has almost ever done. Now, it doesn't feel like it, but the next scene is the one that leads up to the big one hitting Tokyo. The scientists and the bureaucrats and Onodera are on the ship, and Tadakura has to have a sit-down for the really, really bad news. Tadakura says the Pacific side of the mantle is moving fast, and the Sea of Japan's side of the mantle is moving too slow, and it will have to balance out, and that's what Japan is going to get caught in the middle of. He doesn't say this, but it could be related to the geomagnetic reversal and how the outer core gets disrupted during that kind of an event and that's what is causing the imbalance of the outer core. The reason why I say this is that Tadakoro is showing the mantle flow animation again, and he's saying the flow changes so the Earth's crust is massively affected by this disturbance of the mantle convection. He faints, and it is a rather good fainting performance. It's not all overdramatic like a lot of mid-1970s movies from the United States probably would have been. So he goes out to get some air, and this is where things get scary when the earthquake happens. The mantle on the left side pushes Japan down, and the mantle on the right side pushes it up, and in between we've got sinkage. So I'm guessing this earthquake is like a 9.5 because of the absolute devastation, but maybe I don't know. Nearly 55 minutes in, the big tokusatsu payoff occurs, and the Tokyo mega quake erupts. It's impossible to overstate how huge this sequence is. It's unforgettable. It reminds me of the earthquake scenes in the movie Earthquake from 1974, but it's so much worse in Tokyo in this movie. In the movie Earthquake, there's no tsunami, but there sure is one here. Tokyo is in a subduction earthquake zone, but Los Angeles is on a slip-strike kind of zone, so that's why earthquakes in Tokyo are worse. Tadakoro practically says the magic words to start the destruction going, and he looks at the camera, and the camera zooms out a little bit so that everyone is shown listening to him. And he says, In the worst case, most of the Japanese archipelago will sink into the sea. 
He's totally consumed by what he sees as inevitable, given the information he's processed and the gut feeling he's developed about the coming events. In the book, the earthquake happens at around 5 o'clock p.m. The special effects in the movie make it look more like 7 to 8 p.m., but whatever. The eventual wildfires in this are evoking the firebombing of Tokyo during the war, and so the audience is going to go through remembrance of that. Americans and most other foreigners aren't relating to it on that deep of a level. This scene also obviously evokes the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake, and this movie came a few months after the 50th anniversary of that. The first thing that happens is the earth all but opens up. The book reads, Somewhere in the east and extending into the city itself, pillars of light were boiling up from the earth, as though to tear it asunder and climbing toward the clouds. That's what those flashes of light are at the very beginning. There's a pretty popular picture from when the 1995 Kobe earthquake occurred. There was an elevated highway that collapsed, and the elevated highway collapsing also reminded me of the 1994 Northridge earthquake, which happened in California. It was the Golden State Freeway northwest of L.A. that had a large part of it collapse. In the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake near San Francisco, that made part of the upper deck of the Bay Bridge collapse, too. The special effects are a lot of the best of what the 1970s tokusatsu world created. The whole sequence lasts multiple chapters of the DVD. Some of the tech used is obviously models, back projections, superimposition, fake blood, etc. The buildings are collapsing, and the carnage is intense. That part really drives home the sheer panic and the instant gridlock created by this event. This movie and the book are making a point that cars are not going to save you in an event like this, and especially the closer you are to the epicenter. The guy wedged in between two cars did a great job, I think. Only then, when the refinery starts exploding, does the creepy music start in the background. The refineries are most likely the ones in Chiba, which is on Tokyo Bay, or maybe the ones near Kawasaki. There are a bunch of oil refineries there, and in 2011, the earthquake caused a fire in one of the refineries along the bay. You gotta congratulate Teriyoshi Nakano and the other special effects people for creating this much fire in a movie. It likely violated the fire code to stage fires this huge, but oh my gosh, it's impressive. The high rises collapsing from the movement alone is why I'd like to say that this earthquake is approaching a 9.5 on the Richter scale. Even with all the earthquake proofing, seemingly nothing is a match for this earthquake. One of my favorite aspects of this part of the movie is when the people in the subway station are escaping the underground spots that are collapsing or flooding, and they go outside, and then all the buildings are raining down all of this glass on them from the broken windows. It's filmed so well, too. I'm glad they went the necessary step of showing how bloody this would get, all that glass raining down on them, too, and we see this blood just gushing out of them. This imagery is really good, and it makes your mind think that this kind of thing is happening everywhere, and just how violent it is. This is another aspect that kind of makes me think this is like a horror movie. The tsunami exploding through the sea walls is so amazing. Any scene with water flooding to this degree is technically difficult and involves all kinds of precision. The shot from street level and watching the tsunami come forward straight for you, that is so scary and so cool. The family's last words scene is nice and disturbing, and it kind of reminds me of the scene from the 1954 Godzilla with the mom and her little kid. In this scene, the grandpa is telling his family that fire was the worst part of the Great Kanto earthquake, and he references the 40,000 deaths at the clothing compound. So he says, just keep the fires out and we'll be fine. And of course, the tsunami hits them like six seconds later. Right after that is the giant billowing smoke at the out-of-control fire at the refineries. Beautiful and so much fire. Such a gigantic fire. Like in Shin Godzilla, we're treated to a heavy dose of the goings-on from the Prime Minister's standpoint. All of the footage of the burning city is on these televisions and is showing all these explosions. And the explosions recollect the 1923 Kanto earthquake and the firestorms there, as well as the firebombing of Tokyo during the war with the wildfires. There's so much fire in this that it's like a wall of flames that the helicopters are flying into. 
The gravity is so high in the scene with the Prime Minister where he's watching this mega disaster unfold. And then the voiceover of Prime Minister Yamamoto's inner thoughts. That's very effective. And the music is so understated, but it's giving us all of this dread. There's very little that he can do. The Prime Minister is just watching the city get destroyed. He says the bombardment from the copters doesn't seem to have much effect, but now we have no choice but to rely on the defense agency bombers. This is because the bombers are trying to blow up the buildings to create a barrier for the fire. This tactic, however, is not all that successful in wildfires and especially during fire tornadoes. What are the reconnaissance planes and fighters for, he asks, to protect our nation? What is it that we protect? The life and assets of our people? It's Komatsu's point here. Is that he's asking, what is Japan? Is it the stuff? Is it the land? Is it the people? The scenario at the Imperial Palace really grabs at the heartstrings. This scene shows how authorities can be confused about what to do when they're in an ongoing crisis. They also had to deal with the question of the Imperial family's safety when considering whether to let people escape from the fires into the Imperial Palace. The Prime Minister has to call the head of the Imperial Household Agency, and he tells them to let the people in. Clearly the Prime Minister gets sympathy from the audience by taking this action. Even after all of these disaster scenes, the one with the people trapped by the fire is harrowing, and it has to be a lot of association with what happened in the Kanto earthquake. There are 12 million people in Tokyo when this movie takes place, and the Prime Minister is told that the Self-Defense Force has 1,100,000 emergency meals. So that's ridiculous now that this disaster is so huge, that's a very small amount. The U.S. has run into a situation like this before with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Harvey. Japan had this happen in 2011, with the Fukushima nuclear meltdowns especially. That earthquake was so bad that Japan hasn't gotten done cleaning up from that. It will be another 30 years or longer to take care of the Fukushima cleanup. I'd predict 50 years. The total number of dead and missing in this movie is 3,600,000. The total deaths in a 7.3 earthquake if it hit Tokyo now would be 9,700 dead and 150,000 injured. That's pretty bad, but typically earthquakes that hit modern cities don't actually kill a lot of people. The 2011 earthquake killed 20,000 and made 2,500 missing. The most killed in an earthquake was the Shanxi earthquake in 1556 in China. A tsunami can dramatically increase the death toll from earthquakes because of drownings, etc. The tsunami and the firestorms cause most of the deaths in this quake in the movie, and also collapses of buildings were a big deal. The short moment regarding his wife's death in the earthquake is good because the Prime Minister is recalling his wife telling him how Japan is so peaceful, and so she thought that he'd lead this unremarkable term in office, and that's really how leadership works sometimes. You hope to accomplish some things you think need to be done, and you hope something like a catastrophic diastrophism doesn't open up and swallow your whole country into the ocean. Occasions rise that you don't expect, and events that you dread keep happening. If they wanted the movie to be more dramatic, they could have had the Prime Minister just be like, hey, where's my wife anyway, during this whole disaster sequence. If we stop the movie here, and then tied up loose ends in the plot, this would have been a relatively normal disaster sci-fi movie. If the Tokyo earthquake was the centerpiece of the story, of course. But when the next scene begins, the first stage of the D project is running, but the D2 project is about to get started, and that's about getting as many lives saved as possible before the diastrophism destroys the country. The haunting declaration by the cognitive scientist is that the diastrophism will be 1,000 times the strength of the Tokyo earthquake. And here's the genuinely haunting part, that most everyone will be killed because they won't believe that something like that could actually happen. It has been three months since the earthquake, and I want to think they would have evacuated Japan already if Tadakoro told the public, escape while you can. However, if you ran for the hills every time something on TV told you to do that, we'd all be living in the forest before Y2K happened. The guy who attacks Onodera is the guy from Onodera's old workplace, who he totally ditched in order to be on the front lines of this disaster project operation. Not Yoshimura, not that guy, his old boss, but the other guy. 
He was at the beginning of the movie, too, when Tadakura was looking at the first submarine. This scene is funny to me because Onodera virtually doesn't say a word, and it's all this other guy talking. The look Onodera has after he's knocked to the ground is kind of unintentionally funny, too. The big takeaway from the next Watari scene, where the power is knocked out during their meeting, is that the scientists in Onodera are there, and they're sure the sinking of Japan will happen. But their reservation about starting an evacuation plan for all of Japan, when most people think everything's gone back to normal, is that the scientists will look alarmist, and they'll be treated like they're crazy or hysterical, and they'll lose their credibility. This part of the movie reminds me of other stories where scientists are saying the following things are going to happen, and then it's turned into a debate, and the message doesn't go anywhere until it's mostly too late to save a whole lot of people. Dr. Nakata says that 3 to 5% of the population, so about 5 million, that can be saved, 3 to 5 out of 100 million isn't a very good number, but it's better than nothing. The Prime Minister scene is all about getting the government all coordinated to convince the Prime Minister's staff that they're going with the D2 plan. His staff are being political and expeditious. They're concerned with reviving the domestic economy, and like Watari, they're concerned the evacuation plan would look really stupid if nothing else happened with all these predictions of cataclysmic events. To be fair, it would be the stupidest alarmist plan ever if they did try to evacuate Japan and then no diastrophism happened. The Prime Minister says that if one of the scientists starts saying what's going to happen, the Japanese public will be very skeptical of this kind of an announcement. Then the Prime Minister says that there's no way that the funds for an evacuation of this kind of a scale can be hidden away in some kind of discretionary fund in the budget because it would be too large of an amount of money and obviously everyone would notice and start asking what all that money's for. The next scene is absolutely astonishing. It's the first Australia scene, and my international relations mind had a great time analyzing this scene. The actor playing the Prime Minister of Australia is Andrew Hughes. He was in Destroy All Monsters as Dr. Stevenson, not looking very much different. I nearly expected him to have that voice that he got dubbed into. You know, like that, that voice in Destroy All Monsters where he's like, Well, you see, they're trying to... You know, that whatever that... I can't do that voice. I don't know if anybody can do that voice. I don't know what it is. That's not his real voice. But this is Andrew Hughes' actual real voice. And he was in almost 30 Japanese movies. I go back and forth between if I think the Prime Minister of Australia is heartless or if the point of the story was to be realistic and actually act like this was a serious thing. He would rather take Japan's treasure, and he's not as interested in taking the people, because wherever they come as refugees will eventually just become a new Japan. He does have a point about the land in Australia, though. 35% of the country is desert. In the movie, he says it's 70%. So there isn't a lot of room comparative to how the country looks on a map, and desert isn't really an optimal place to build a new country in anyway. The Japanese ambassador is played by Nobuo Nakamura, who's been in many Toho movies, including quite a few covered on the show so far. The ambassador says 5 million total to emigrate from Japan to Australia. It looks like some of the scenes were dubbed, because the voice track and the video track are a little bit out of sync. The Japanese ambassador is telling the Prime Minister, please save us. And it really does hit you that anyone who these other countries can't take is going to perish. There are many moments in this that convey the gravity of the situation very well. I think that if the scene went differently and the Prime Minister of Australia had just said, oh yeah, sure, five million, okay, sure, whatever. Or if he said, not even one million, I won't even take that many. Either way, those two scenarios would be less realistic. But since he is the leader of another country, the Japanese audience is told in this scene, basically, that other countries may not accept unlimited amounts of refugees, and everything's not necessarily going to be great. What if it was the U.S. that was sinking, instead, all the way up past the tallest peaks, and that the U.S. had to implore other nations for mercy and to take lots of American refugees? How would that realistically play out? I'd be interested to see which country would take the most Americans. It's surprising how disconnected Onodera is from his family and from Reiko. His family doesn't know that he's stopped working at his old job, 
and Reiko is looking for him. But then we find that Tadakoro has done the unthinkable. The newspapers showing what Tadakoro looks like are hilarious to me. Two of the newspapers that were shown have just Tadakoro's disembodied head, and it looks so sensational, and he even has that squinty left eye in all these newspaper pictures, and it's just kind of hilarious. The media is screwing up everything, and they're making him look like a kook. But then, at the interview on TV, he does himself no favors by looking like a violent kook. I think that moment looks kind of funny now, but I think Tadakoro is doing the right thing out of genuine concern for what he is sure will happen. And his instinct ends up being dead right. This is a bad moment for Tadakoro attacking a colleague on live television. His credibility and his career just went down the toilet. This is rather quickly followed up by another tense moment between the D-Plan members involving leaks and Tadakoro's TV appearance. They're upset with Tadakoro's meltdown and how it discredited the whole mission as well as his own career and his respectability. Dr. Nakata sets them straight by demonstrating how leaks work. The negotiations have already begun with other countries, so the info about how Japan is going to be gone, that will get talked about and the Japanese public will find it out anyway when foreign media report it. So since it's inevitable that this will come out, may as well do it ourselves, but not necessarily with Tadakoro getting really mad at the other scientist when he laughed about the most serious situation that Japan will ever face. Onodera sympathizes with Tadakoro's state of mind, though. Tadakoro might be more depressed than anyone at this juncture. This may be as good of a time to mention this as I'll get, but there's a lot of sadness in the country of Japan about disappearing. It's a countrywide depression. That's what makes this more compelling, is if you're Japanese and you're watching this. The fact that it's the whole country that this is happening to, of course, matters. It makes it more meaningful. Now that we're done with the, our three dramatic scenes, the former co-worker on former co-worker violence, scientist on scientist violence, and scientist on scientist almost violence, there's the D2 outline scene with Watari. Watari says one is a priest from Nara, one is a sociologist from Kyoto, and one is a psychologist from Tokyo. And when, and when the first time he said this, I, I was like, what? They all walk into a bar? What? This trio of experts is an interesting way to plan an evacuation phase outline. It would be nice to have more things done this way. Some consider a committee of experts as more preferential during emergencies than political leadership. The Imperial family would have to go somewhere since they're the oldest royal family on Earth. The first idea is that the Imperial family should go to Switzerland, but Watari says one from the Imperial family should go to the U.S. and one should go to Africa. It's intriguing that they are going to be separated and they'll be put in different non-Asian countries. Finally, the big reveal is the three cases of how the Japanese nation should move forward. One is to have the Japanese make a new homeland, somewhere, not sure where. That would keep them together, at least. Another idea is that it will be one big diaspora, and the Japanese integrate into their new home countries. I sort of see that happening in real life if this happened, but maybe not. The third one is realistic and very Japanese. It's for those left who can't escape Japan before it falls into the ocean, and the solution is to do nothing about it. It's unavoidable, and many millions will die in this way. It's also the way Watari ends up, we assume, if the diastrophism takes him too. Watari is noticeably sicker in this scene too, mirroring the sickness that the country is going through. The next scene is where Onodera visits his brother in the Kansai region of Osaka. They have just buried their mother, but this was not said in the movie. His brother is considering a job in Canada. Onodera knows the truth about what's going to happen in Japan, and his brother doesn't. Onodera tells him that he should go to Canada, and the sooner the better. His brother doesn't get why Onodera says that. In the book, Onodera actually says, Japan is... and then he stops himself. In the movie, it's a voiceover of what Onodera is thinking, and he says, Japan is... and the scene ends. Onodera has become drunk on sake by this time, 
and it's driving him up the wall that all these people around him aren't going anywhere and they need to start escaping. But of course he shouldn't be causing a panic. There's some visuals of his brother when he's drunk and he's wandering around Osaka. His brother's running. It's implied that he's hit by a tsunami or something and it looks like he's killed. Just try to put your mind into that spot though. If you're Onodera, it's like you're walking amongst hordes of dead people and they just aren't dead yet. They, they're just going to be soon, though. And that's really dark. He is having a breakdown about how his whole country is going to be destroyed. It's tacked right on at the end of his meltdown, but Reiko is the one that bumps into him at the end. So many scenes from the book are in the movie, beat for beat almost. The scene with the Prime Minister and his scientists, and the red and blue map of doom simulation they have going is harrowing. This is the we're all screwed scene. The animations on the screen look obscene at times with that red part stretching out there like that. There's a lot of scientific explanations and finally someone gets up and says, oh, who cares about that? How long do we have? That's all really matters. How, how much longer do we have? The situation has definitely gotten worse. It's 10 months left and so nearly everybody's screwed. The prime minister decides he may as well tell everyone in two days or so and at least try to control the panic. He can't be a politician anymore, and he's obligated to warn everyone to save as many as possible. Obviously, transportation infrastructure is paramount. Convert cargo ships to be able to carry more people. Build more airports. Build up seaports so that many can escape. Onodera's end of the drama dominates the second half, while there was more of Dr. Tadakoro in the first half of the movie. Onodera's idea is to get married to Reiko and flee the country. He doesn't want to stay and help the evacuation. That's not what ends up happening, but this is a Japanese disaster movie based on a depressing disaster book, so his dreams are going to get crushed, of course. In the next item of news, though, Dr. Cox, who is the American-looking scientist, he says how a huge diastrophism is going to hit Japan and possibly split the island of Honshu in two. This was done before the Prime Minister's intended conference, so when this scientific society releases their report, that lets the cat out of the bag and all the papers pick up the story. The Prime Minister says that all individuals will be prevented from going abroad starting tomorrow. The reasoning here is that he wants to make the evacuation as ordered as possible so that people could be gathering at certain points to be able to be rescued instead of having just pandemonium occur. Onodera not only tells his co-workers that he's having second thoughts about leaving, but once he gets up to start his escape from Japan, things get a lot worse. Mount Fuji erupts. Reiko is in the telephone booth during the eruption, and I can't help but think it's like, it's like that scene in The Birds when she's in the phone booth and the birds are smacking themselves into the glass. The volcano is unrelenting, and finally she's cut off. And this is when the two of them officially get cut off from each other and separated by the disaster. They totally lose track. Has anyone been in a disaster and gotten cut off from the person that you were with? I've heard that that's scary. After some volcano stock footage, we're treated to some great tokusatsu magic. The eruption, the ground opening up, but especially the lahar special effect was fantastic. A lahar is superheated mud that's caused when a volcano eruption melts glaciers on the top. The steam looks so good, and the liquid flows in exactly the right places. That looks fantastic. The UN scene is a lot more plot about the specifics of Japan's refugees and how they're to be dealt with. All of these meetings remind me of Shin Godzilla. Now I'm expecting quicker cuts. These numbers are incredible. 7.8 million have admission to 21 different countries. No more than 8.4 million have destinations planned. So 101.6 million Japanese have no plans to go. That is so incredibly grim. The UN representative from the Philippines says the refugee camps will become filthy, crime-infested, disease-ridden slums. He absolutely lets the Japanese have it. This sort of exchange rings so true to what I think would happen in this kind of a science fiction scenario. Gorath is another excellent example of a science fiction scenario done right. Gorath is another complex disaster, and like Gorath, 
The plan is followed through in the movie, and in Gorath, the plan succeeds. However, this plan takes Japan's sinking into account, so there is really no plan to succeed. It's a plan to make the best of a failure. And what is winning in this movie? Is saying 7.6% of the population of 110 million is saving that many winning? There isn't very much winning in this movie. The concept of moving 110 million people is impossible in the time allowed. And if this did really happen, goodbye west coast of the United States, goodbye islands in the Pacific, any place that all these tsunami would hit would be totaled. The water level would go up significantly, I would think, from all the land sinking into the ocean. Earthquakes and volcanoes would probably happen all over. Enough volcanoes erupting could cause global cooling. The movie did actually give us a small bit of that when one government person mentioned how messed up the Korean coast would be from all of the effects of the diastrophism. The montage of the evacuations is good. It's all ordered, which, yes, it's Japan, but still... Only 2.8 million have gotten out of the country, which is very low. The Prime Minister's animated little speech is a little too strong dramatically, but he has to perform the mission of going to foreign countries to beg them to accept more Japanese people. There are 21 countries mentioned at the UN, and at the time, in 1973, there were 135 members of the United Nations, so there are many, many countries that did not accept any Japanese refugees. The last 20 minutes of the film is fabulous, and it makes watching the entire movie more than worth it. Models are used a great deal when we're watching Japan actually break apart. It's meant to be what viewing the country from far up in the atmosphere would look like. The model of the islands looks incredibly convincing, considering it could have looked completely fake if they had the wrong people doing it. Shikoku is the fourth largest Japanese island. The flashing of light when the huge cracks appear is something from the book, like I said. It's like the earth is opening up and there's all this energy just coming out. There are flashes of light and it's meant to enhance the idea that this is an unprecedented breakage of the ground. So far down and it releases these noises and these flashes of light from the energy released when this occurs. These shots are mixed with stock footage and then more traditional models of mountains and other features. The shot of the evacuees going down the windy path as volcanoes are exploding as a composite with some superimposition in order to make it look like the debris is overtaking them. The model with the town just sliding into the water is great. If this was real life, could you imagine the tsunami generated by something like that? The scene with the American president is something I'll spend a little time on. The translation is kind of annoying to listen to because he's speaking English and you just want to be able to hear him. But he's saying the U.S. is going to start constructing a place for refugee camps for 2 million Japanese in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. Would this be kind of a little reference to the Japanese internment camps that were used during the war? It sounds pretty ominous if you're going to go in that direction, but at the same time, I don't think that's what this is doing. It seems pro-U.S. to me since the U.S. is mobilizing the 7th Fleet and the Air Force to do everything they can. I wouldn't expect the U.S. to just give Japan all of Texas or something, and those three states more or less make sense and it would seem plausible. I think, again, that Komatsu was trying to be realistic when he was writing this scenario. These scenes remind me of Shin Godzilla when Japan is finding other allies to help with the plan to neutralize Godzilla. They go to France and Germany, among other countries, in that movie. The moment with China in this movie is remarkable because there's actual Chinese people in it. China doesn't do a whole lot, but they send their navy to Kyushu and Okinawa to rescue people. It's a little tense to watch this even now, but there are times where Japan and China cooperate on issues as they arise. I kind of wonder if this story got updated to right now, what the US and China would do in this story. The same goes for Russia and the Koreas. The Soviet Union is mentioned too, which is sending ships to pick up evacuees from rendezvous points. If you're a country close to Japan, I think the incentive to help the Japanese is partially to help people in need, but it's also politically expedient for those other nations to not look terrible by not helping them. There's talk about a new airport at Hamada, which is 40 miles northwest of Hiroshima, on the coast of the Sea of Japan. 
This implies that they built some large runways in a new airport in this city of about 50,000 or so in population, and it has large port facilities and rarely gets hit by strong quakes. So that's why this particular city is mentioned in the country, because it sinks from east to west also, more or less, so it makes sense that this city would be one of the ones left. The D-team members discuss how the world has come to help us, but the tragedy is that they waited until the diastrophism actually started to sink whole islands to give the Japanese a hand. But these two guys conclude that's how it works. That's more Shin Godzilla kind of bureaucratic dialogue we're used to hearing now. In the book, there is a riveting page or so where there's a Pan Am Boeing 747 with almost 500 people on it taking off at Osaka Airport. As soon as the plane starts its takeoff roll, a huge earthquake begins. It reminded me of the scene in the 1974 movie Earthquake, where the plane is trying to land and an earthquake occurs. The scene in the book ends with the plane taking off, and then it's implied that that could have been the last plane out because the earthquake just completely destroyed everything. The view of Osaka is terrifying when they fly over it. The water is so high that only the top of Osaka Castle is still above water. So it's just like an Atlantis-related story. Everything is sinking and very fast. Anytime there's water in special effects, I admire the extra difficulty the water makes because it can be really destructive, and if you don't get it right the first time, you're in for a lot more work to get it right the second time. The models of the islands sinking looks really great, and there are nice effects along with it. It looks like dry ice is creating all of the steam. It's what's around that which creates the atmosphere. The explosions and the Earth's crust breaking apart looks great, too. The Sanriku coast is the northeast coast of the main island of Honshu. A north-south crack breaks off where the northeast part of Honshu is, which is the Tohoku region. The view of this is sort of the same view as a satellite, or like the view from the International Space Station would be. The view of Hokkaido looks like the south part of the island is breaking apart. Then we're taken to the Kansai region and the Tango Peninsula. It's on the west coast. The evacuation into the boats in that scene is pandemonium. It's kind of tough to watch because you realize that they're going to get hit by a tsunami and everybody's too panicked to listen to the warnings. Then we go somewhere else and Reiko is looking out to the sea. Onodera is the tough guy in the helicopter, and he's warning everybody of the tsunami. He does a good job acting, and even though he's ignored, he is correct. The tsunami coming at them, that shot, is so ominous. The model ships hit by the water is literally just a bunch of water thrown at them, and all this water gets thrown towards the camera. When we get back to Reiko, she's in the rain trying to get to safety. I don't mean to laugh at this part, but it is so, like, inappropriate to have this music going on. It's way too joyful. They're playing the love theme of uh, Reiko and Onodera at the time that she's running through this rain. She's getting pelted by all these water droplets and everything. I had to laugh at this part because it's just so... Uh, it's just inappropriate. The fact that a tsunami happens at the end of the music is, and destroys literally everything is is ironic, considering that the music was... Not exactly the right tone for that. <laughs> because, like, the music is like, la da 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 tsunami, boom, just gets everything. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's not the right uh, cue to be using at this time, but I, it's not that big of a deal. But it, I, not only did I notice this, but when I showed the movie to at least two other people, they also mentioned that, and they didn't even know the tsunami was coming. <laughs> The overview model of Kyushu and Ok... <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> the overview model of Kyushu and Okinawa shows us how much of Japan is left. And, it, and at, towards the end of that shot, it pans down to Okinawa, and it looks like Okinawa is almost totally gone. The steam coming from the map model is probably uh, symbolic of volcanic action. The next Dr. Cox scene gives us some more that the book definitely touches on. He's confused as to why the central part of Honshu hasn't broken yet. And he says there's a huge amount of energy that's located in that spot, but the island hasn't broken there yet. And this is the difficulty with predicting earthquakes. Just because there's a lot of energy potential in one place, that doesn't tell you much about when the earthquake is actually going to occur. 
but once that huge part breaks, it will speed up the sinking of the rest of the island. The model says there are only 11 days left, and so panic sets in regarding the Imperial family. The Imperial family has to be moved to Switzerland. It's funny, just a year before this, in Godzilla vs. Gigan, Switzerland was referred to as a place for evil corporations to hide, but this year, one year later, Switzerland is a nice, secure place for the Imperial family to hide from all of the calamity. Finally, Honshu, the main island, erupts in the center. The smoke coming out of the crack looks so nice, and the model of the electricity towers all mangled from the earthquakes looks great. There is so many nice little touches like this that looks so pretty. And when you have all the CGI that you could want in the whole world, for some reason this just looks more organic and just looks special. The pictures of all the places around the world are snapshots of all the activity happening. And it's sort of like saying, here's the world at the time Japan sank. The un-PC Australian Prime Minister returns, and this more un-PC Newsweek cover is a bit of a shocker, calling the Japanese survivors kamikazes. Onodera is the poster boy for the struggle of trying to save every last Japanese person from the cataclysm that's taking place. Onodera has really changed from where initially he wanted to escape to Switzerland with Reiko, to becoming a folk hero and a humanitarian. Sure, he's still part of the D Project, but there's more at work here than just that being his job or something. I would suggest it could possibly be his patriotism or his national spirit that has activated him and made him stay in the dangerous area trying to save people. The Australian Prime Minister makes some rather cringy comments about how the fleeing Japanese are like kamikazes spreading themselves all over the globe. His assistant isn't very much better, seeming eager to wipe the country off the map. This is another moment for the story and for the movie to convince the Japanese people that none of these countries is going to treat them like their brothers and go out of their way to take the most refugees. The message is that they have themselves and each other to depend on the most, and that they will be the ones to continue Japan's future. The government operation is over, the D-plan is over, and most of Japan is gone now. They're exhausted from working. Lastly, the final Watari scene is upon us. Just as Japan is dead, he's dying too, of course. The part John LeMay mentioned, where Watari says he wants to see Hanai naked and she does it, in the book, he looks at her for a second, and then he closes his eyes. That's what the book says happens. And that would have been interesting, having that part included in this ending. It might have seemed too much of a contrast with, with the disaster happening in the background here. Since the rest of the ending is sad, meaningful, yet depressing, I'd be happy even if that scene was made and then cut and then maybe included as a special scene on the DVD release or something with English subtitles. By the way, I'd buy that DVD with English subtitles, the original Japanese version of this movie, hint, hint. Watari tells Hanai that she should find not just a Japanese man, but any man, and get married and have children and live a happy life. Watari is thinking about how the world would be in a post-Japan state. Watari is okay with her just finding someone who will be the one, whatever their ethnicity or nationality is. What I would not have guessed is the part about Tadokoro coming to Watari's private residence and deciding to commit suicide by staying with Japan until the last of it sinks. There are suicides mentioned in the book, but there's not much in the movie about suicide. The part about that in the book is where it's giving us the final figures of how many people escaped, died, etc. So there were 70 million evacuated, 12 million dead, and 30 million left on the sinking islands. 30 million, which later they say 20 million, is a horrifically high number. That's more like a figure for how many deaths happened in major world wars. The ones left on the islands, some of them committed suicide, and many of them were men in their 70s or older who wanted to trust Japan's future with younger generations. Now this part is not touched on in the movie, but it's interesting. That appears to be what Tadokoro is doing. 
It makes sense. It did not come out of nowhere that Tadakoro decides to do this. His suicide may also have to do with the shame that he feels from his disastrous TV appearance, because that's likely why we don't see him around as much in the second half of the movie. I wasn't surprised that suicides would be mentioned as a way out for many, but Tadakoro doing it was less predictable. Tadakoro says in the book that when he found out Japan was dying, he wanted to die with her. Watari says that it is a love suicide. Then Watari says, ah, the Japanese, a strange race indeed, unquote. This is absolutely the best time for Kaiju Vision's philosophy to kick in, because there's no moment in this movie that conveys the Japanese national spirit more than this one. The people staying on the sinking islands love Japan so much, and in that kind of way, that they don't want to live in a world without Japan. They're connected to the mountains, and the forests, and the land in general, and they chose to go to death with the land. It's exactly the right thing to guess would happen, given the national spirit of some Japanese. If this happened now, would there still be a lot of suicides? Hmm, yeah, definitely, no question. In the book, Watari also admits he's half Japanese and his father was a Chinese monk. We're shown the zoom out of Earth, where it looks like Japan is all gone. The movie is missing something in the book that I really wanted to see. In the end of the scene with Watari, there is supposed to be a typhoon hitting Japan during that scene. That is supposed to have helped finish everything off, and also add to the destruction in this story. It disrupts the last-ditch efforts by the rescue crews to save people as well. The ending is really something. Reiko is on a train, and the title reads, Somewhere on Earth. So she could be in Siberia or who knows where. She looks so hopeless and just dead tired and just dead inside, too, because of all that she's been through. Meanwhile, Onodero's on another train, and it looks like he's in Arizona or Utah or something, and this music during the train moments is terrific for that part out in the desert. The Arizona music is great because it sounds like it's from a western. It sounds like a, a John Ford film or something. It's amusing considering how bleak the movie is. The last note in Sato's soundtrack is one note from a trumpet, and it sounds exactly like a train horn. They're on their way to build a future for the Japanese people again. When I learned that there had been talk of a sequel, I thought, well, how's that going to work, especially if you're picking up where you left off? Because that's a completely different kind of movie. Like a movie about the aftermath of a disaster? That doesn't really sound all that fun on just on paper. But like John LeMay said, they went in a different direction for the sequel. Rebuilding society in the aftermath of a disaster film isn't as interesting as a disaster film itself. The movie has taken us so far. We've gone from Japan existing to Japan being completely gone. The audience has meditated on what it means to be Japanese and what Japan even is. This was a huge phenomenon at the box office. It's definitely one of my favorite tokusatsu movies ever. It's big, it's atmospheric, and it's full of meaning. It teaches us about the Japanese national spirit. Is it the land? Is it the people? It's both, but in the end, it's the people, and they must continue living and surviving. This movie is such an enriching experience to watch and enjoy. Well, that finishes the chronological run-through of this epic film. That concludes part two, and I will move on to our related topic. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. In part three of the podcast, I will be analyzing a topic that was either brought up in the film or was going on at the time of the film's release. The Great Kanto Earthquake is referenced in the film many times during the Tokyo earthquake sequence of scenes in the submersion of Japan. This earthquake in the movie is in fact referred to as the Second Great Kanto Earthquake. That part of the movie is a modern remake of the 1923 disaster. The submersion of Japan was made and released in 1973, which was the 50th anniversary of the Kanto earthquake. September 1st, 1973 was the first day of shooting for the submersion of Japan. The Great Kanto earthquake happened on September 1st, 1923 at 11.58 and 44 seconds a.m. 
so just about a minute before noon. It was a mega thrust earthquake. The magnitude I've seen most commonly is 7.9, which is a major event for sure. It's called the Kanto earthquake because of the epicenter being very close to the Kanto plain, which is the plain south and east of the mountains in the Tokyo area and includes the area around Tokyo Bay. I'll get some figures out of the way and then move on to this relation that it has to the submersion of Japan. The population of Tokyo in 1923 was two and a half million. There were 40 hours of fires, which caused the destruction of 63% of the homes in the city. Yokohama was 72% destroyed. The quake and fires killed 140,000 people, injured 100,000, made 3.25 million homeless, and there were 40,000 missing. 570,000 homes were destroyed. It killed 4% of the population of Japan, which that is absolutely massive. It caused mudslides, avalanches, a tsunami of 30 to 35 feet, floods, and at least five fire tornadoes and 130 major fires. There was a typhoon traveling past the region which created winds that were unpredictable and which made the fires worse. Because it was almost noon, there was a lot of cooking going on for lunch so that there were many fires when the buildings collapsed. The fires broke out almost immediately as a result. Over 35,000 people were guided... This is really bad... Over 35,000 people were guided to an open space called the Clothing Department of the Imperial Japanese Army. This was thought to be a safe location, but a fire tornado ripped through and killed almost everyone. It was the place the most people died. Only 2,000 survived. The chief of police, who told the people to go to this location, committed seppuku after all the people were killed. In the area of Yoshiwara, which was known for the brothels, it had a high number of deaths because some of the women were locked in where they worked because otherwise they would escape and not come back. There were 57 aftershocks. Three of the aftershocks were pretty big. Communication broke down almost immediately. A lot of the walkways were actually melting because it was so hot during the fires. Firestorms this big, like in the movie, radiate heat so far away from the actual fire. The fires and fire tornadoes also burned all of the oxygen out of the air, and the heat was so intense that you could be really far away and still be very seriously burned. Some people who jumped into water to avoid the flames drowned or were suffocated because there wasn't enough air. There were so many people that were seeking refuge that there were piles of people filling the waterways. The village of Nebukawa was completely destroyed in a mudslide, train station and all. The battle cruiser Amagi was at Yokosuka. It was being built at the time and was in dry dock. The earthquake damaged the hull of the vessel so seriously that it had to be sold for scrap. The earthquake broke water mains all over, and it made fighting the fires impossible. Sanitation went downhill after the earthquake because of how destroyed the place was. There are around 1,500 earthquakes in Japan every year. What happened in the Kanto earthquake is comparable to what happened in San Francisco in 1906. It was also a 7.9 earthquake, it destroyed many buildings, and a conflagration ensued that burned down a very, very large part of the city. The differences are that there was only a 10 centimeter tall tsunami in San Francisco, and that there weren't any fire tornadoes reported, and that there weren't large-scale attacks on scapegoats blamed for things that they didn't do. Also, the San Francisco earthquake was not a mega-thrust earthquake because there was no subduction zone involved. This was the San Andreas Fault. It was a slip-strike earthquake. There is a high probability in the future that the East Bay will be struck by a major earthquake. Yokohama had many foreigners living and working there. There were also plenty of diplomats. Yokohama had its own Chinatown as well. Because of the way that Japan was back then especially, is that all of these sort of foreigners and diplomats and 
people who were different were kind of put into one place, and Yokohama was that place. Meanwhile, Tokyo was uh, very homogenous and also very, very conservative. Yokohama was where the, a lot of the trade with outside countries occurred, and the silk trade was a big business. In 1960, September 1st was made a holiday called Disaster Prevention Day. It is partially to commemorate this day in 1923 because this was such a significant historical event. Schools in Japan hold a moment of silence at 1158 in memory of this occasion. This was one of the most significant and nation-changing events that ever occurred in Japan. It is an inflection point where Japan became more nationalistic and the events that would happen in the empire's future were seemingly made sure more than ever from this point. The groundwork for the Empire of Japan's behavior toward the United States had already been laid. The Empire was already fortifying islands in Oceania to act as a barrier against outside attack. I addressed that issue in the episode before this, episode 53, on colonialism in Oceania. Those islands had been in Germany's possession until World War I was over. The Empire had colonized Korea in 1910. There was plenty of nationalistic sentiment in Tokyo, still quite a conservative city as I said, and it's still considered that today. Back then, the foreigners and the diversity were all concentrated in Yokohama. Japanese apprehensiveness towards outsiders was very strong in Tokyo. For that matter, the rest of Japan was like this as well. Suspicion of foreigners and non-Japanese was high, and Korea already had an independence movement and the Tokyo and Yokohama area had many spies trying to find out if anyone's plotting anything. This is about the overall political climate. When disasters happen, events can happen that are related to the overall political climate. Anti-foreign sentiment was probably very high, and when disasters happen, some people want to take advantage of the situation. They wanted to do this in order to further their own political power. After the earthquake was over, there were nearly two days of fires and disorder. Nationalists spread rumors about Koreans, saying that they were committing arson, that they were trying to overthrow the government, engaging in rebellion, engaging in sabotage, rioting, and looting, and poisoning wells. Well water was cloudy because of the earthquake, but rumors were spread about Koreans poisoning wells. Some newspapers printed these rumors, and some of the police and military police were involved in this action, too. Groups of vigilantes went around lynching Koreans and sometimes Chinese and even non-Yamato Japanese. At least 6,000, possibly many more Koreans, were killed, and this wasn't just in areas affected by the fires. The authorities at large wanted to round up and protect Koreans, but the reality on the ground was that there were quite a few authority figures that were engaged in the killing of Koreans. This is one of those times in history that it got really ugly with xenophobia and panic going in tandem with each other. Almost 25,000 Koreans were taken into protective custody all around the country. With all of this societal collapse, quite a few Koreans were rounded up and killed. It was just total chaos and a total breakdown of order. After the earthquake was over... Martial law was put into effect. The military police and the Imperial Japanese Army took advantage of the situation and liquidated people considered to be political enemies of the empire. Anarchists, communists, and socialists, as well as Chinese community leadership and Koreans who were considered leaders of the Koreans, were executed. The way they did this was they'd accuse that person of trying to take advantage of the circumstances during the disaster, but that is exactly what these people were doing themselves. Emperor Taisho and the Empress were not in Tokyo during this earthquake. They were out of town. The mob violence lasted three days, and it wasn't until panic died down and the government conveyed a strong enough message saying lay off the Koreans that this stopped happening. The disaster certainly didn't make the Japanese national spirit look very good. The earthquake and fires all helped to determine where Japan would go historically in the future. Many Japanese thought that the earthquake was about them being paid back for their Western consumerism and their extravagance, even their supposed giving in to immorality. So the democracy and the Roaring Twenties atmosphere that America was enjoying got cut short in Japan. 
many Japanese got too introspective, saying the earthquake was punishment for them being self-centered and morally degenerate. This was what state Shinto had encouraged them to think. There was a correction in the national dialogue from democracy to imperialist rhetoric about how not to fall victim to the excesses of democracy. Kawasaki was another area hard hit in the Kanto earthquake. Currently, Kawasaki has a high population of Koreans. There were two anti-Korean demonstrations by nationalist groups recently that were planned for Kawasaki, and a new hate speech law has prevented one of those demonstrations from happening. So it seems that old habits die hard, and these overall sentiments in the national political dialogue and the political environment still exist today. The anti-foreign and anti-outsider sentiments are still shared by some. There's definitely not much of this anti-foreigner violence being shown in the submersion of Japan. However, there is a prevailing sentiment that the Japanese are now the outsiders themselves. They are losing their country, and now they have to beg to be saved. So the tables have turned. They are refugees themselves, and they have to go to other countries that they haven't necessarily been friends with over time, and so now those countries are holding all the cards. That puts many Japanese watching this movie in what I wouldn't doubt would be an uncomfortable position. They are watching a movie that challenges their thinking about outsiders, because in this story, they are the outsiders, with no place to call a home country. So they have to put up with other countries who decide their fate. They have to depend on countries like Australia. They have to give the Australian Prime Minister an artifact in order to try to gain favorable feeling from him. And then behind closed doors, the Prime Minister says the Japanese will use Australian resources for them to build their own country again. And that's turning the xenophobia on its head, because the concern right after the Kanto earthquake was that the Koreans were overthrowing the government and the Chinese were building their own country in Yokohama, and that they were going to bring all of this foreign influence into Japan. In the Submersion of Japan story, the other countries are worried about Japanese people creating their own settlements, and that they will influence the countries that they're refugees in. So Japanese are the new outside influencers. In this story, the second Kanto earthquake and Japan's demise overall creates many refugees, and it kills a much higher number of people, and it foments anti-Japanese sentiment in the world by having to ask all these other countries to let them in. To the Japanese, it's about their survival as a people, but to the host countries, they're a complex question to be processed and then dealt with. They become a burden, and a political football in the future, I'm sure. The Japanese in this story have to face what the Koreans and other foreigners had to face in Japan 70 years ago. They must worry about their very survival in a potentially hostile new location away from their home country. That's astonishing the way this works. Like I said, this movie could be considered a horror movie depending on who's watching it. The recovery effort was fast and unprecedented in size. The U.S. gave the most aid and it was delivered by the Pacific Fleet. When the vessels came into the bay, the Japanese Coast Guard told the USS Stewart that Japan doesn't need their help. This aspect of the aftermath of the earthquake made no sense to me and then obviously it did one second later. They had too much pride and didn't want to look like they couldn't handle things on their own. And they were also suspicious of us that they thought that we had some sort of ulterior motive or that we were trying to influence them from the outside with the aid. The authorities actually tried to stop the ships from landing, saying we don't need any food. The way the U.S. went around this was to compromise and leave the food on the docks for the Japanese authorities to then take possession of to distribute. That way, it wasn't Americans giving food and other aid to the victims of the disaster. There were also many donations from civil society organizations such as charities. The first time this phenomenon occurred was after the earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal in 1755. This connection between the U.S. and Japan, this outpouring of supplies, money, food, clothing, it was likely the best moment between the two countries before World War II. However, some Americans accused the Japanese of not being thankful for what was donated. 
But the thing is, the foundation of U.S.-Japan relations had many cracks of its own, and a true alliance between Japan and the U.S. would not happen until Japan genuinely democratized from the top down. Things would get much worse before they would get better, obviously. It wasn't this that made the disaster infamous. It was more about the killing of the Koreans and the steps further into totalitarianism that the Japanese military and government made. Things only got worse between the U.S. and Japan after the recovery effort. The 1920s are a pretty xenophobic time in the U.S. anyways, and there were a lot of immigration restrictions. As the Empire of Japan kept expanding, the more Americans objected to it. When the U.S. cut off a lot of oil, this caused Japan to decide to attack Pearl Harbor in an attempt to knock out the entire Pacific fleet. Relating this aspect with refusing aid after the Kanto earthquake to the submersion of Japan is rather interesting. After the 23 earthquake, the authorities were too proud and mistrustful to want to accept aid, but in the submersion of Japan they have no choice but to bow down on their knees and beg other countries to take refugees from their sinking country. So they have to swallow their collective pride and their individual pride, and then they have to ask for help from countries that they don't exactly have great relations with. After the earthquakes and the fires were over, a previous prime minister, Count Ganohyoe Yamamoto, became prime minister. He had been an admiral in the Imperial Japanese Navy. He was prime minister from 1913 to 1914. He was a supporter of democracy and was not on the right end point of the political spectrum. After the earthquake, the government recalled him and made him prime minister and installed an earthquake cabinet. The cabinet and Yamamoto were tasked with reconstruction of the city and restoration of public services. He served for 11 months or so as prime minister. One thing the government and the people considered doing was moving the capital of Japan out of Tokyo and back to Kyoto, where it had been for a long time before. This idea was ruled out. But was it a good idea? Like, was that prudent? I do see merit in this kind of consideration. But humans aren't very good at going to places that are less free of disasters. Tokyo is obviously a good place to build a city, On you know, if you're just looking at the map. It's a plain with a bay and easy access to the Pacific. New Orleans is at the mouth of a river and at the south end of a large lake next to a gulf. Chicago is at the mouth of a river next to a lake, on one of the biggest watersheds in North America. But there aren't any disasters that can take out a whole city like Chicago. At least natural disasters. Tokyo can be hit by so many things. Volcanoes, earthquakes, typhoons, floods, tsunami. But when these kind of disasters occur, the choice is nearly always to rebuild the city and just try harder next time. If you're in Japan, there are only so many places you can go, and there are a lot of places in Japan still prone to all kinds of disasters. But nature is hard to avoid, and there aren't many places that will never be affected by a calamity of some sort. There is also the fact that some would look at moving the capital back to Kyoto as some kind of surrender, surrendering to nature. Abandoning a whole city is even more of a kind of surrender. Yamamoto's time in office was cut short by the event referred to as the Toronomon Incident. The incident reminds me of when U.S. President William McKinley was assassinated by a man who had just heard a speech by an anarchist. On December 27, 1923, a communist attempted to assassinate Crown Prince Regent Hirohito, who is now known as Emperor Showa. The Crown Prince Regent was in his carriage, and a man by the name of Daisuke Nanba shot at the carriage, but missed. The bullet did hit a chamberlain who survived. The carriage was en route to the Diet Building for a ceremony where Hirohito would have opened the newest legislative session of the Diet. Why did the cabinet resign, then? They took the blame for the security lapse that easily could have led to the unthinkable. Obviously, there's a monumental level of shame generated by this, so the cabinet and some other officials involved resigned. This was the first of three separate assassination plots and or attempts against Hirohito. To further illustrate the level of shame involved with this, Namba's family changed their family name and went into self-exile in the Dutch East Indies to escape the shame. 
The government passed a public security preservation law in 1925 because of the state wanting to not tolerate dissent from communists or a whole lot of other people. These kinds of laws would be in effect until the end of the war when Japan was reintroduced to democracy by the United States. This re-democratization was followed by a Cold War configuration towards conservatism. What's interesting is that the Prime Minister's name in the submersion of Japan is Yamamoto. This couldn't be a coincidence. The name is likely an homage to him. Perhaps it's an homage to his values and for his work regarding the reconstruction of Tokyo. The task was to rebuild Tokyo so that this doesn't happen again in the next earthquake. The next earthquake in Tokyo is referred to as X-Day in Japan. This is a 7.0 or higher earthquake that is expected in Japan in the near future. There is supposedly a 70% chance that a 7.0 earthquake or higher will hit Tokyo before 2050. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government put out a 338-page manual regarding this event and what to do. So Tokyo gets a 338-page booklet, and Los Angeles residents gets an app that warns you when the earthquake is about to hit that might work or might not work. Good luck. If and when the next Tokyo earthquake happens, the emergency services will be overwhelmed. People might have to do a lot of walking to get places, and it will be a long recovery. Tokyo is, however, as ready as it will get for this event. More than 300,000 buildings could be destroyed in such an event. There are still parts of Tokyo where there are houses built from wood and other fire-catching materials. These neighborhoods could be hard hit if fires start there. Water, electricity, and transportation could be knocked out, leaving millions either stuck in the city or evacuating from the city. The Kobe earthquake in 1995 destroyed 400,000 buildings, so a bad earthquake in the Tokyo area could definitely do at least that much damage. The greater Tokyo area consists of a population of 38 million people, and it is the most populous city in the world. The Kanto Plain is vulnerable to devastation by earthquakes because the flat land makes it easy for the energy from the quake to roll right through it. There's very little to stop it. So, it wasn't just in 1945 that Tokyo got turned into hell on Earth. It was turned into hell on Earth in 1923 as well. This has been a rather tough subject to research from an emotional direction because it was such a horrific event and because it changed Japan for the worse long term. Getting to some economic figures of note, GDP growth in 1973 was 8.0%, which was very high. I'd like to thank John LeMay for being on this episode. He was so much help telling us about this movie and all the cool background about it. Thanks again, John, for coming on the show. This episode is dedicated to the great actor Keiju Kobayashi, who played the character of Dr. Tadokoro. He's probably best known for his role as Prime Minister Mitamura in 1984's The Return of Godzilla. He passed away in 2010. He has at least 221 credits for various roles and a very prolific actor in Japan. I look forward to seeing him in more movies. The next episode of this podcast will be 1974's The Prophecies of Nostradamus. It'll be a special treat to cover this amazing movie. It was self-banned by Toho because it was that edgy and controversial. It technically is a rare movie, but try to see the original Japanese uncut version if you can, so that we can fully appreciate this wild and crazy tokusatsu experience. If you'd like to send some feedback, I'd love to hear from you. The email address is feedback at kaijuvision.com. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Kaiju Vision Radio is available on Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, Podcast Addict, YouTube with scenic videos, and on kaijuvision.com. I'm Brian Scherchel, and this is KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. See you next time.